Right then, welcome back everyone. As you can see, we're doing something a little different tonight. Once upon a time, I read the Eye of Argon on a, on a stream. A rather infamously bad piece of fiction. So much that it's a Herculean struggle to read it without bursting out laughing. That experience, you can imagine, changes a man. Makes him wonder what else is out there. What other transcendently awful fiction can we get our hands on and turn into a drinking game? Now, I'm familiar with some of the other classics, such as My Immortal, that one really awful Harry Potter fanfic, you know the one, and I've had a few other recommendations as well, which incidentally also involve Harry Potter. All were tempting, to be sure. Then I came across Atlanta Nights. I'm going to summarize from the TV Tropes page, but this story is a doozy. The short version is a publishing company in Maryland put up some disparaging articles about sci-fi and fantasy genres, and a group of such authors, led by one James D. McDonald, took it upon themselves to retaliate. They submitted, quoting here, the most unreadable, incomprehensible train wreck of a book they could conceive, all under the collective name of Travis T. Suffice to say, the publisher fell for it, and offered to publish the book without realizing that it was a professionally done shit post. This is not unintentionally bad. This story is bad by design. That's where this stands out. The authors had to work to make something this awful. Anyway, they revealed it was a hoax a month later, and the offer was obviously withdrawn, but by then the damage was done. As for the plot, it's described as a plotless, rambling pile of nonsense, allegedly about a bunch of rich people in Atlanta, one of whom kills a guy in a car, in a car accident and then starts dating his widow. There's apparently little consistency from chapter to chapter, and after thumbing through the first few pages, I suspect it lives down to its reputation. Anyway, usual rules apply. I drink every time I laugh or stumble, which is where my handy little uh, margarita comes in. Oop, spill a little there. Uh, off to a running start tonight. Anyway, this thing is 287 pages of condensed hell, so we'll see how far I can get in a single night. Thus ends my prepared remarks. I'm going to drop a link in channel right now if you'd like to follow along. It's also right there at the bottom of the page, or at the uh, bottom of the window there. Otherwise, kick back, relax, do your grinding and other games while you listen, and without further ado, we begin. <laughs> Spilling little... Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Today it does. So, we'll get one more sip in before we start. Alright. Atlanta Nights by XXX, Chapter 1. Pain. Whispering voices. Pain. 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 Need pee. New pain. What are they sticking? God. Oh. We're off to a running start here. I'm already repeating myself, but yeah, it's <laughs> the pain. Uh, hey, Octal, good to see you. Good to see you all. But yeah, it, this is going to be a drinking night. Anyway. <clears throat> what are they sticking in me? Sleep. Pain. Whispering voices. As you know, Nurse Eastman, Nurse Eastman, the government spooks controlling this hospital will not permit me to give this patient the care I think he needs. Yes, Doctor. The voice was breathy. Sweet. So sweet and sexy. We will therefore just monitor his signs. And, uh, signs has a possessive apostrophe in it. Serious trauma like this patient suffered... Serious trauma like this patient suffered requires extra care. But the rich patsies controlling the hospital will make certain I cannot try any of my new treatments on him. Yes, doctor. That voice was so sexy. Bruce didn't care about treatments. He cared about pain. And he cared about that voice... Because when he heard the voice, the pain went away, just for a few seconds. Like, Report to me if there's any change, the man's voice said. Yes, Dr. Nance, said the sexy voice. A door closed, and Bruce heard breathing, and he smelled the enticing smell of shampoo and perfume. It was Chanel number no. 5. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it, though? Uh, I'm going to take another drink just for that. He opened his eyes. All he saw was the roundest, firmest pair of tittles, that's T-I-T-T-L-E-S, he'd ever seen in his life, all enclosed in a crisp white nurse's uniform. I'm in heaven, he said. No, he tried to say, but his voice wouldn't work, his mouth was dry, and was, there was some terrible tube thing in his nose. And hey, what's that thing in his dick? <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> oh. Hmm. Oh, gotta do another drink for zero. Mm. 
Oh, man. <laughs> uh, right, yeah. What's <laughs> that thing in his dick? It hurts. The tits bounced like Aunt Alice's molded jello back at home and then moved away. Oh, she was just straightening the covers on the bed. Bed. Bruce realized he laid in a bed. His left arm strapped down with something sticking in up a tube on the top of his hand. Right. Bruce looked up. The tits belonged to a beautiful face carved out of ice and whipped cream with a pair of glowing emerald eyes around that perfect face. <laughs> uh, they, they were not kidding when they said this was intentionally written bad. <laughs> oh, man. They, they Effort went into just how awful these first few pages have been. Around that perfect face was brown hair, like one of those supermodels, all puffed up. <laughs> oh, you're awake, Mr. Lucen, said the sexy nurse. Bruce worked his lips, but couldn't speak. Well, Mr. Lucen, said the sexy, the sexy voice went on. You're probably wondering what you're doing here, honey child. He realized the voice had the accent of a sexy southern peach. You were in an auto accident, Mr. Lucent, but don't worry. You'll be just fine. I, I think they're trying to do, like, some kind of Louisiana or possibly, like, a Creole accent or something. But, I don't know. This is this is supposed to be set in Atlanta, and, you know, the cover has palm trees on it. So I, I think this is... I, I'm really not clear where this is supposed to be. This is kind of all over the place here. But anyway, it, it says this here is the finest hospital in Atlanta. And you are in the care of the finest doctor, Dr. Arthur Eastman. <laughs> oh yeah, there will there will be a drink counter. Unfortunately, I can't figure out how to get that to work for the stream, but that will be added to the post stream. That will be added to the footage when I upload to YouTube. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, Atlanta, Montana, exactly. We're probably that. Yeah, we're. It, it's got to be five or six, I think. Anyway, Bruce tried to speak, but just moaned. Now. Is there anything I can get you? Nurse Eastman asked, moving to the other sides of the bed and fluffing the pillow. Bruce wanted to feel those titties. That's what That was what he wanted. Not that he could do much else, he realized. Everything hurt, right down to that thing, whatever it was, in his dick. Uh, he said. Nurse Eastman's eyes lit up like a Christmas tree lights. Now you're talking! Oh, she gave a girlish giggle. You are recovering just fine. I have to go tell Dr. Eastman right away. Wait, he grated. <laughs> uh, Margarita. Also, hey, Kirby, good to see you. Anyway, uh, she paused, giggling again. A frightened giggle now. A frightened giggle now. A child, a childish giggle. Yeah, you know what? That's some stumbling. I'm gonna drink there. Okay. As though a little girl on Halloween, going door to door, instead of seeing a paper McKay witch. That's got to be paper mache, but it's like McKay, like, uh, well, first, my mind goes first to Ian McKay from Fugazi, but yeah. Hey, or Goblin was suddenly grabbed by the real thing. I don't remember, Bruce croaked. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, exactly, dick. Oh, man. No, she said, shaking her head vehemently. You don't remember a thing. Now you just rest. She went to the door her hips swaying like palm trees in a Hawaiian hurricane. Bruce lied there in bed, trying to recover his memory. All he could remember was the screeching of tires apostrophe, like a steam engine gone crazy. And then there was just all that pain. Hell. Hell on wheels. That's what it was. Yes, S. That's... Yes, and then E-S after the yes. Hell. On wheels. While outside the door, Nurse Eastman, leaned, Nurse Eastman leaned against the wall, her breasts rising and falling with passion as she tried to control her gasps. Oh no, she thought. How could it be? Out of all the hospitals in Georgia, they would bring him here. She raised shaking finger, fingers and outlined the shape of her lips, moaning softly as she remembered the one day she'd met Bruce Lucen. That single day at the high school prom, she'd gone with her cousin to please their parents. What? What? Okay, she went to the prom with her cousin to please their... 
I'm not going to try to make sense of this right now. we got to move. Since his date got sick, and he had rented his tux and everything, even though she was in nursing college. Enchantment under the... Oh, come on! <laughs> the enchantment under the sea dance? Oh, <laughs> you assholes. Oh, of course they'd drop a fucking Back to the Future reference in there. Hmm. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, this is... <laughs> this is heavy. <laughs> she could remember it as if it was yesterday. Their eye met across... Okay, their one eye. Uh, their eye single met across the room. Locked, held, molding passionately. It was the gaze of molten heat. A supernova of total lust. Even though the old, she was only 17. And she was 23. <laughs> Also, what's a twenty-three-year-old doing at a high school prom? That's oh, this this is throwing up some red flags already. <laughs> oh, we're already drinking, Fortune. We are drinking right now. I gotta be on like nine right now, I think. Anyway, it was only a matter of time before she ditched her cousin and Bruce ditched his date, and they found themselves in the back of Bruce's Chevy. She moaned, writhing in memory, until a voice splintered, shattered, pierced her memory. Nurse Eastman, who was the head nurse. Her warty nose quivered, her eyes blazed with suspicion. The old bag! She didn't know what true love truly w She didn't know what true love really was. Oh, I'll drop the uh, link in the channel again. Here. Have a look. This is some wild stuff. Anyway. Uh, right, she wouldn't know what true love really was. I'm sorry, Margaret Eastman smiled. I just had a cramp. If you are sick, you may be excused from your shift, the head nurse opined. But, uh, okay, yeah, she that's that sure is an opinion. Right. I, I will be fine, but I promised Dr. Nance I would let him know when his patient woke up. Margaret gritted and ran away before the head nurse could stop her, her high heels clattering on the floor like the death knells of doom. Dr. Arthur Nance looked up when the nurse entered the room. Arthur had always been the brightest star at school, from a very early age. He was always elected class president in grammar school, middle school, and high school. He was class valedictorian at his graduation. And when a lot of his friends went to mechanic school or junior college to mess around with the business, he went straight to the university medical school. <laughs> yeah. Good question. I, I get the feeling that this is going to be... In the context of submitting this manuscript, I think it was written from the imagined perspective of someone with a nurse fetish. That's the impression I'm getting. That's what I think the writers were trying to channel here. Anyway. But then Arthur ran into something far worse than tough teachers or tough grades. Prejudice. Yes, prejudice. Not race, but class. All the snobs from the wealthy families laughed at him for his accent. And when he tried to join the most popular fraternities on campus, they hazed him without letting him know until too late that he would never join. I mean, you know, if they're hazing him, yeah, I mean, that's, my understanding is that's not necessarily happening with every fraternity, but yeah, you think it's somewhere along the line it'd be more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> because fetish, exactly. Arthur got his medical degree, but he became embittered against rich people and politicians and anyone in authority. He's a loner, Dottie, a rebel. Wherever he went, he was sure there was some conspiracy against him by those in authority. He was sure of it when he didn't get hired to any private hospitals or to a lucrative practice among the rich, doing fat removal and facelifts for 25 grand apiece. No, he could only get a job in this hellhole, where every night the ambulances brought in drunks and suicides and crazily homeless and the battered wrecks the EMTs scraped off the freeways, like this lucid jerk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for materialism. Yeah, that, these people need to talk to some co communist college students. Maybe start putting up signs posters that posted everywhere. Get the work of Krasmazov going in them. Anyway, like this lucent jerk. Arthur was sitting there brooding about all these ills when Nurse Eastman came into, his doc into the doctor room. <laughs> Eternal thirst, quite. Is my patient awake? He asked. Yes, she said. And then she wiped her eyes and throatily whispered. <laughs> okay, I don't know what a throatily whisper is like. I'm going to guess it's something like, Doctor, 
I have to request that you excuse me from attending to this patient. Request denied, Dr. Nance said curtly. I will not have one of those braided spies who work for the hospital trustees killing my patient. I'll go seize he now, he stormed and stormed out of the room. Almost lost it there. Margaret leaned against the wall and wept a sorrowing flood-like of tears. She knew Bruce would emerge from the fog of the painkillers and he would recognize her. What if he told someone about that night at the prom? All her life, Margaret had worked hard, harder than anyone else. Her sisters, all of them far more beautiful than she, had coasted through life like a toboggan down the snow hill of life. There's a metaphor for you. But Margaret had a vision at an early age and knew she was meant to be a nurse. Her mother had scorned her. Her father had laughed at her. So she put herself through nursing school by waiting tables at a low dive at night. Five long years she toiled with never a day off, not even at Christmas, just so she could walk out with her head held high and her degree in hand. <laughs> Dr. Mantis Tabagi. <laughs> oh, lordy. Once, just once, she had strayed from the har path of hard work. Just once, she'd let herself relax, do her cousin Ted a favor, go as his date to the prom. Well, she learned her lesson, she thought. She never thought she'd see Bruce loosened again, but now here, the cruelty of the fates laughed at her, just like her family. Bruce Lucid was here, helpless, in her hospital. It was only a matter of time before he remembered who she was. And what would he do then? She wept even harder. I mean, you know, presumably if he's hooked up to a whole bunch of medical equipment and at, by his own admission has a tube in his dick, I think he's going to have more important things to worry about. Anyway, Chapter 2. The Atlanta sun slanted low in the west, rain showers predicted for later that afternoon, then clearing. Bruce Lucent looked from the side window of his friend's shiny Maserati sports car as they wheeled their way westward against the afternoon traffic. I'm glad you could give me a ride, Bruce Lucent muttered, his pain-worn face reddened by the yellow sunlight, what with my new car all smashed and all. His old friend, Isidore, shook his massive head at him. <laughs> Damn it. Oh, uh, he's got a big head friend. That, uh, just it, it painted a picture in his mind of just like this dude running around with his friend that's got a bobblehead going on. Anyway. We know how it must be to have a lot of money but no working car, he said, the harsh Macon County drawl of his voice softened by his years in Atlanta high society. It's my pleasure to bring you back to your fancy apartment, and we're all so happy that y'all is still, is still alive. Y'all could have been killed in that dreadful wreck. Isidore paused to put on the turn signal before making a safe turn across rush hour traffic into the parking lot of Bruce Lucent's luxury apartment building. Y'all lulls gets a new car on Monday. I, that's, it, it's got y'all, then another apostrophe, then two more L's. You know what, that's fine. I am, I am permitting drinks midstream in addition to my own stumbles. There we go. I don't know how I'll be able to drive it with my arm in a cast, Bruce Lucent shoots back. It's lucky I wasn't killed outright, like so many people are when they have horrid automobile wrecks. Fortunately, fast and efficient emergency medical service, services... Based on a program founded by Lyndon Baines Johnson, the 36th President of the United States. <laughs> what? What the? <laughs> okay, bringing up the origin of emergency medical services. That's yeah. That's you know that's that's like encyclopedia triggering randomly. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, based on a program founded by Lyndon Baines Johnson, the 36th President of the United States, helped y'all survive an otherwise deadly crash, Isidore chuckled. <laughs> he nodded his head toward the towering apartment building, in the very shadow of Peachtree Avenue, where Bruce lived his luxurious life. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Like, the apartment building is in the shadow of the street. So, this is this is some kind of, like, downhill. This, basically, Atlanta, San Francisco. That's, that's what I'm getting from here. I've never actually been to Atlanta. Any Atlanta natives, feel free to correct me. I, I fear this story may be creating an incorrect impression of your city. So young, yet so wealthy, based on, based on his skills as an expert software developer. Make a pun, huh? All right. Mm. I grew up for it. Uh, 
let's see. So young, so wealthy, based on his skills and an expert software developer. Yeah, I'll keep reading and I'll see what comes to me. Give me just a minute here. I don't feel very fortunate, Bruce complained as his friend helped him from the low-slung red car. I hurt all over and don't remember a thing after I left that bar on Martin Avenue. I wouldn't be surprised if the police didn't want to talk to me about what happened. Not that I could help them because I don't remember anything, he added as an afterthought. Isidore pulled the collapsible wheelchair that he'd bought at St. Irene's Hospital from the open trunk of his new Maserati and unfolded it on the curb beside where Bruce painfully stood, his recent ordeal only recently over. He helped his chum sit in the new wheelchair and then pushed it rapidly toward the gleaming doors of the high-rise tower. The soft southern breeze blew the scent of magnolias over them as he said, This is certainly something new for me. Oh, man. I'm gonna need to keep reading. I need, I need, I need a lead in for something. We shall see. Give me a minute here. Never say that, he replied. Isidore shook his head, his red ponytail flipping in the soft breeze as he wheeled his best friend into the lobby, past the uniformed security guard named Amos, who saluted them, and then into the elevator to the 14th floor of the luxury high-rise apartment building that we keep bringing up for some reason, recently built in downtown Atlanta. The long-time security guard saluted the pair as they passed. What lucky people, he thought. So young and rich, they can afford to live here. Not like me. I have to live across town and wear a uniform and salute the young rich kids who make more money in a minute than I can make in my whole life. Bruce thought that the dark elevator walls were closing in on him, and despite the chill in the air... And just with the chill in the air-conditioned air, he could still smell the flower smells from outside. The upward elevator started slowly into motion, as if it was reluctance to climb the hundreds of feet. Hurry up, Bruce cried aloud. Bruce pounded on the arm of his recently acquired wheelchair as his friend asked, Bruce, what's the matter? Is y'all so impatient to get home that the elevator's too slow for you? Imagine if y'all had to take the emergency stairs in your condition. He chuckled. Okay, stairs is... S-T-A-R-E-S. That's, yeah, that that's staring at someone and not the, the stairs. Oh, man. You might say it's not polite to stairs. Ha-ha! <laughs> uh, I use that for alpha protocol. Give me a minute. I can think of one better. Anyway, Bruce glared at his friend who stood behind him. And the wheelchair as the elevator hissed to a halt on the 14th floor. The dark paneled doors sliding open with the sound of well-oiled machinery. And then he was pushed by his friend out to the hall. And then down to the door labeled 1414, his apartment door. Y yeah, the, the sentence structuring is odd. Like, we're focusing on details of things we have already passed. And it's not clear how far in the motion the characters actually are. Like, they pass the security guard, they get into the elevator, and then it's about the security guard and his, uh, backstory. And, yeah, they're kind of... The perspective is wobbly, for lack of a better word. Bruce searched his pockets for the key he knew he did not have. Damn it, he said. And then, they kept everything, even my wallet at the hospital. How am I going to get it? You, you'd think you would have sorted this out before leaving the hospital. Isidore knocked once at the door, and then it at once swung open. The stunning vision inside, an echo of pulchritude, uh, that's P-U-L-C-H-R-I-T-U-D-E. I cannot guess what it means or how it's pronounced. I feel like I'm staring into something that my mind is not grasping properly. It's like a word said by the great old ones. Anyway, an echo of pulchritude in a bright red dress. Oh, he's talking about a lady. All right. Seemed to take their breath away. It was, Prene it was Penelope Urbane, Bruce Lucent's long time, and very beautiful girlfriends, plural. Pulchritude, cleanliness. Okay. Okay, so that is a word. All right. I thought they were just making, making shit up. But anyway, yes, it's a lady that happens to be two girlfriends. Clearly, he's dating a Siamese. He's dating some Siamese twins. Penelope, who had walked in, who had walked in the door of Lucent Software, asking for a job, and a good thing is being that she did. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, <laughs> a good thing is being that she did.
Sometimes it don't be like that, but it do. Oh, because he had one for her, a position, so to speak, that only a beautiful woman could fulfill, and she filled the role perfectly as the beautiful girlfriend for those social occasions when he needed to appear on the front page of the newspaper with a beautiful woman on his arm. So suddenly we're switching from software to hardware development. Ha <laughs> ha! Everyone looked and thought he was lucky. But it wasn't just luck. It was planning that he fell in love with this beautiful woman and her with him. He gave her his glance and she gave him hers. I mean, uh, sure, yeah, whatever. Bruce looked at her and whistled, thanking God, thinking whatever God was listening, that the auto accident that he had apparently, he had apparently been in had spared his family jewels. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. oh man, yeah, yeah. This, this is. This is like what John Romero tried to be as a software developer after he made it big with Doom and like the whole like Eidos Ion Storms thing. Th 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 this is what he thought that would this this is what he thought that would be like. Just yeah, ru running around with supermodels and just living the good life. It's insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been nice knowing y'all. I'm only a half hour into this shit. Oh man. Right. Uh, Bruce looked at her and whistled, thanking whatever God was listening that the auto accident that he had apparently been in had spared his family jewels, for he wasn't one to put to pasture his rampant desire for his stunning young woman, at least not yet. He snapped his fingers and snarled, Take me inside, Isidore, or you're fired from my software company. Uh, okay, did Isidore work for him? Like, I, I, I'm gonna, uh, I, I have to fact check this. Isidore, Isidore, his old friend. Okay, so they did not establish that he was a colleague. They just said old friend. I guess he's a old friend that works for him. Right. Something like anger stirred in Isidore's breast. Yet Isidore laughed at Bruce's favorite joke as he pushed the millionaire software developer indoctrinated by New Agers into the stunning studio apartment. Okay, it was probably just like an in-joke or something. Stunning studio apartment that he rented in this exclusive high-rise tower. Uh, again, we're doing the Eye of Argon thing where we are over-describing and repeatedly describing the thing we have long since established we're in. Like, they keep coming back to, this is a building. This is an exclusive high-rise apartment. And they keep saying it over and over. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I hear you, Civic. I, I, Civic. I hear you, Octal. <laughs> still, still driving an 07 Ford Fusion myself. Just she's holding together. Credit where it's due. Anyway, uh, right. Uh, exclusive high-rise tower. The walls were as white as the carpet. Uh, the walls were white as was the carpet. The walls met the ceiling at right angles, where glistening mirrors and gold frames studded the walls. Penelope Urbane, or Penelope Urbane had been a poor girl she knew. Though she pretended to have grown up rich and happy in the suburbs of Atlanta, it was all a lie. Now she looked into one of the many mirrors. Now she looked into one of the many mirrors on that studded the walls of her boyfriend Bruce's apartment and liked what she saw. Two hazel eyes with perky eyebrows, red like the hair of her head, and other places met her smoky gaze in the mirror. She smoothed the hair back from her elfin ears, making it tumble down her back past her shoulders, broad but not too broad, broad enough to support the luxurious breasts, but filled the front of her scarlet sundress. Oh, God. Oh. Then started tame enough, and it just builds, and it kept going. Oh, man. She smoothed the hair back from her elfin ears, making it tumble down her back, past her shoulders, broad but not too broad, broad enough to support the luxurious breasts that filled the front of her scarlet sundress, glowing in the afternoon sun, the hot Georgia orb of fire that came through the window as she admired her trim shape and flat tummy in the mirror. She looked, she thought, like the bad girl heroine of a tawdry romance novel. Yeah, I am a little over halfway through this margarita. This, this is, this is gonna, this is gonna fucking suck. Uh, 
The expensive shoes she wore, high heels that matched her tight dress and set off her red hair, were delicately shaped by the stiletto heels and sharp toes, the lift they gave curving her creamy calves and raking her rounded bottom move like the se a semaphore of love. I'm, I'm not even... I'm not sure what a semaphore is. Feel free to enlighten me. As she walked past the framed mirror that she'd been looking in. Her hazel eyes sparkled as she took in the sight of her newly returned boyfriend in the wheeled chair that marked him some disabled person. Would you like a drink, Eve? <laughs> What the fuck? Would you like a drink? Oh, oh God. Would you like a drinky? Penelope offered her recently returned bow as his friend pushed him in front of the widescreen TV that dominated the West Wall without making it seem overpowering. Damn it, yes. Bruce Lucent repeated, looking at this vision of feminine lust on two feet. I've been in the I've been in the lousy hospital, and they don't let you have a little drink there. He opined. A again, we're opining things that are being stated as fact here. Then I want to get to my new computer so I can check on my hot stock options and write more on my best-selling software development. I've wasted too much time locked in that smelly hospital. It's full of sick people. That's full of sick comma people. Penelope and Isidore looked at each other, as only two redheads can look at one another, as Bruce delivered himself of this comment. Okay, so we're getting some kind of ginger conspiracy here. I think Penelope and Is Isidore, they have some kind of, like, subconscious telepathic communication, and they're going to kill Bruce. That's that's what's going to happen here. <laughs> this, this, this guy would absolutely be a crypto bro. <laughs> this, this guy would be... This guy would be posting his bored apes on Twitter and then get him all stolen. And he's like, what did I just spend $60 million for? <laughs> I need to go to the stock market to do a business. Exactly. Oh, man. Then let me fix you something nice with expensive vodka and gin. Penelope giggled as she went to the kitchen to make ice cubes. Okay, yeah, sure, she's making ice cubes. When she was young, she had been called Penny, but now she was worth a lot more, she mused, as she busied herself at, a at the full bar that filled the west wall beside the large television set that Bruce bought had bought with the first proceeds of his award-winning mutual software. He often went on the modern internet to make his money. Okay, yeah, th this, dude, it, this dude is a crypto guy. He's <laughs> th This is... This is a guy that thinks the Sigma, gr Sigma grind set is a real thing. Jesus Christ. And when Isidore's gone, I can greet you properly, Penelope whispered, as she handled as she handed the old fashioned to Bruce in his chrome wheelchair. Okay, the old fashioned is capitalized. I don't know why. She looked I, I, I that has to be a drink name. That has to be uh whatever she was mix mixing. Vodka and gin. <clears throat> She wouldn't fill that ice cube tray. Exactly. Uh, let's see. She looked significantly at Bruce's tanned, lean frame as she handed him the crystal glass. Yeah, Bruce responded. What's he still doing here? That's here, H-E-A-R, instead of here, H-E-R-E. -E. He turned to his old friend and pointed out, Why is don't you go park the car? My old car has crashed, you know. I mean, didn't they... Didn't they park the car? Uh, maybe it's like a meter or something? I don't know. Whatever. I can't, I can't figure out Atlanta socialites. I, my, I do not have the galaxy brain for it. An old-fashioned is usually bourbon and something else. Okay, yeah, so it is a drink, and it's probably not what she made. Makes sense. Yes, Bruce. Isidore smirked as he turned, knowing what kind of scene of wild debauchery was about to be enacted in that very room, because he had known it for himself firsthand during the long week Bruce Lucent had been in the hospital. Oh ho Getting a little uh, side action going on with Penelope there. Way to go, Isidore. I'll park the car. I'll go park the car. He went down the sleek elevator that he had so shortly before ascended, wondering if Bruce was going to be the man he had been before losing consciousness in that horrible accident. Then the gleaming lobby doors were before him. He planned to take the Maserati out onto Peachtree Avenue, Peachtree Avenue in search of an empty parking place as upstairs a miracle of love was performed by Penelope and Bruce. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Okay, old fashioned is some form of whiskey, angostura bitters, and some form of oil. Got it, yeah. So, probably not including gin. Interesting. Anyway, uh, yeah. He planned to take the Maserati out on a Peachtree Avenue in search of an empty parking place. Again, where did he park? Like, where is the car stopped? Eh, whatever. As a as upstairs, a miracle of love was performed by Penelope and Bruce, young lovers at the very height of their beauty, wealth, power, desire. Going down, Isidore Trent chuckled as he pressed the down button and laughing at his own joke. Had he but known what was to come, he would have been laughing out the other side of his mouth. Okay. Chapter 3 As you've probably heard, Yvonne, be began Penelope Urbane, seriously brushing a, screaming scarlet, a gleaming scarlet tress out of her tearful eye, Bruce has come home from the hospital after his accident. Yes, you must be very happy, said Yvonne sympathetically. He was badly hurt in that auto accident. Yes, he was badly hurt, responded Penelope honestly. All right, we're going to get into a Metal, Metal Gear Solid Codec conversation here. But he is home now, and I'm very happy about that. We need to have a serious discussion about this, said Yvonne earnestly. Bourbon whiskey is a typical old-fashioned. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, we need to have a serious discussion about this, said Yvonne earnestly. Yes, we have some very serious things to discuss. Yeah, th this is seriously, this is Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yvonne, Yvonne Perrin raised her glass, began to gulp down the martini she had ordered, and then she signaled the waiter to bring another one. Yvonne drank too much and did not eat right at all, and Penelope was starting to get worried about her friends, starting to get worried about her friends' habits in eating and drinking. Her cheeks were almost as red as her hair already, like red del capital D delicious apples under green leaves, which were her eyes, and the dark pupils, which were like little curled up caterpillars in the middle. Oh, that's a that's a fucking image right there. Jesus. Do you think it was, do you think it is a good idea to have another one Yvonne? Okay, another one one is not spelled out in this sentence. It's the number one printed out. Interrogated Penelope. Yes, one more will not hurt me, and then I will quit, retorted Yvonne. <laughs> Dummy thick, exactly. Oh man. They did not notice that Stephen Suffern was watching them secretly from his table across the dining room. They were at the Polo Club for lunch. The restaurant was a large room with a number of tables and some big windows looking out over the golf course and the lake. Both men and women and couples were eating lunch. Steve, Stephen Suffern was the best masseuse the club had ever had. After lunch, Yvonne might get a massage. She thought he was a stud, watching him across the room with rippling muscles like a bull and well hung too. <laughs> Damn it. I could feel it in my bones. That's where it was going. And it still caught me off guard. Uh. <laughs> she could see his pulsing man. <laughs> Fuck. Uh. Okay. I expected the dick descriptions. I did not expect additional dick descriptions. <laughs> <sighs> oh man if I don't survive this tell my wife hello anyway she could see his pulsing manhood stuffed into the tight silky blue gym shorts he always wore at work she thought she should have made an appointment for a massage Stephen Suffern thought Penelope was a real looker far too good for that stuffy software developer Lucent who needed to work out once in a while and lose 50 pounds he flexed his muscles and thought about the book he had just read. The Joy of Sex. <laughs> okay. I'm going to assume The Joy of Sex is a real title for something. Oh, God. Ugh. This is this is pain. This is pain, Pecco, folks. Uh, I appreciate that, Ivory. I expect I expect my warmth to be harvested for as long as it lasts. It is a real book. Okay, I'm yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, of course. This muscular, apparently well hung masseuse would be reading it. 1972 by Alex Comfort. Okay, that 
Alex Comfort writing The Joy of Sex, that is that is that is a name that his life could not have turned out any other way. That is a, that is a name designed to write something something of a lascivious nature. Anyway, it always surprised people that this athletic man was such a great reader, and he liked that. Hello, ladies, said Stephen Suffern, passing their table. Hello, Stephen, purred Yvonne. She had such a hat she had such a crush on the handsome masseuse at the polo club. Sometimes she saw him working out in the gym, and she was turned on by the sweat smell of his sweet. Oh man. I almost lost it there. The sweat smell of his sweet. She could not wait to think of a plan to try to get him into bed with her. Hello, Stephen, Penelope whispered softly. Or should I say, Hello, Stephen. Do you have to work today? Maybe we could get a massage later, said Yvonne boldly. I only have room in my apartment book for one lady this afternoon, explained Stephen. He's a very... Stephen has a very selective clientele list, I should say. Uh, it appears to be. Oh, that is all right. You go on. Yv you go, Yvonne, said Penelope kindly. There's a vil There's a video game adaptation for the Philips CDI. Are you serious? There's a video game... Okay. Jesus Christ. You know, I'm morbidly intrigued, and I'm going to... I'm going to write this down. I I need to look into this. Just a second. C-D-I... Joy of Sex. Wow! Oh, man. We are learning some shit tonight. Anyway, all uh, right. I only have one room in my I only have room in my apartment book for one lady this afternoon, explained Stephen. Oh really? I did not know that. Possibly the first of only twenty seven video games to get an adult only rating. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, let's see. Oh that is alright. You go, Yvonne, said Penelope kindly. She knew her friend had a crush on Stephen, who was a real stud. Yes, he said that earlier. I must get back to Bruce anyway. He needs me. Stephen would have liked to give her a massage, but he was stuck with her friend. Yvonne was too old for him. He stood up and walked past their table and flexed a bicep for effect. <laughs> oh, he literally he literally flexed as he walked away. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking of I'm I'm thinking of Halloween and is <laughs> the alien. I don't know. I, I feel like we have shifted I, I feel like Steven has shifted the target of his intentions at all of a sudden. Anyway, yeah. He he stood up and walked past the table and flexed a bicep for effect. See you later then, then Yvonne, he said meaningfully. You have to keep in mind the standards of what passes for a video game. Yeah, I, I I I mean, you know, the CDI infamously had those Zelda games, which were just totally were just completely rubbish. And that's pretty much all I know about it, but I have to imagine that the rest of its catalog is of comparable quality and comparable fid comparable fidelity to any series it might be based on or an, an, an entry in. CDI is kind of a Wild West platform. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Anyway. Uh, right, where was I? Yvonne watched him go by, his muscles pulsing and rippling like waves under a thin blanket of tanned skin, like a freshly baked cinnamon cake. Penelope, Penelope began to sip her mint julep. Ah, timely, considering we had just had the Kentucky Derby. That was wild, by the way, the 80 to 1 horse won. That was nuts. I think he likes you, Yvonne, said Penelope thoughtfully. Why do you think that, Penelope, said y Yvonne Urbane. He always comes over to talk to us when we are eating lunch at the polo club, explained Penelope. Just, you know, she's, she, I think she is, I think Yvonne apparently has struggles with object permanence, and so Penelope is helpfully explaining where they are at this moment. He is cute, I think so too, but I have Bruce already. I think you are the main attraction here for him, not I, hissed Yvonne jealously. No, I'm not, soothed Penelope. Anyway, you can get him, you can get a massage and have him to yourself. I will go home and take care of Bruce. They're ma they're very matter of fact about fucking the masseuse. This is uh, this is very sex positive, I must say. The waiter walked over to their table and brought yet brought another martini for Yvonne with a shot glass of extra vodka on the side. 
try to <laughs> try to eat the others after winning. That's awesome. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> Are you dead, son? <laughs> uh, it's getting there, man. It's getting there. I did not order extra vodka, said Yvonne impatiently. She was mad from the conversation with her friend Penelope, who all the men seemed to be attracted to. Her cheeks were flaming red fires like a volcano ready to explode through the cold emerald stones that were her eyes. She knew Penelope thought she drank too much. The waiter said, I'm sorry, miss, but we are out of cocktail onions, and the chef sent this instead with his compliments. Yvonne Perrin stood, uh, stood up and walked over to the waiter and took the shot glass full of, vod full of vodka and poured it out in a planter that held a spindly rubble sh rubber tree that never got enough light to grow pro properly, even though it was near one of the windows that looked out onto the lake where some ducks were floating like they were waiting for the... <laughs> oh god, this, this whole paragraph is one sentence. You gotta read this. Ah, oh, thanks, Zero. I needed that. Yvonne Perrin stood up and walked over to the waiter and took the shot glass full of vodka and poured it out in a planter that held a spindly rubber tree that never got enough light to grow properly. Why is does it matter it's a rubber tree, even though it was near one of the windows that looked out onto the lake where some ducks were floating like they were waiting for someone to throw them some bread, but there was nobody there at this time of day? <laughs> what the f Fuck. Oh, God. That paragraph was a journey. I, I'm going to print that out and frame that somewhere. Oh, man. Calm down, Yvonne. People are... St okay, calm down, period. Yvonne, people are staring at you, said Penelope worriedly. Uh, I, I don't think worriedly is a word, but sure, yeah. Do you feel okay? She asked questioningly. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna laugh. I'm not. I'm not laughing at that. Exercise calm. Deep breaths. You got this. I'm under control. Right. You never understand how I feel," moaned Yvonne. "I'm just as good looking as you, but I am older. That is not fair. I mean, you should be bragging about that. That's that. That that gets harder to do as you get older. You should be. You should feel accomplished." The men go. The men all go for you, and you have Bruce already. I am afraid I will never find a man now that I am getting old. Oh, come on now. That's a very dated assumption. I mean, honestly, we don't even know how old these people are. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Yvonne people. People of Yvonne from Yvonne Town. <laughs> oh, man. Yvonne et Niage. Anyway. Yvonne sipped her martini, which tasted like liquid ice on her tongue. It helped her feel calmer. Yeah, I'll bet it did. She asked the waiter, What brand of vodka is in this drink? It is a French vodka, imported specially for the polo club, thinking that ought to impress her, and picking up the empty glasses from their table. Do you want to order something to eat now? Yes, I will have a steak, said Penelope decisively, and I want it cooked rarely. You know, don't don't cook it all the time, just cook it every now and then. Otherwise, I want something i got to chase around the plate. I am a gourmet when it comes to beef, so tell the cook not to overcook it. Yeah, about that. I'm not sure... The, the French are known for many fine alcohols. I'm not sure vodka is among them. I will, I will defer to those more knowledgeable of alcohol than I, but I suspect that is... That is a nudge at people that would know that. But yes, that's almost certainly not actually French vodka. Anyway, I'm, I am a gourmet when it comes to beef, so tell the cook not to overcook it. Yes, ma'am, said the waiter said smoothly. Anything else? He added. French fries, and please bring the horseradish sauce. A Caesar salad for me with the blue cheese dressing, Yvonne decided. I am watching my weight. Leave the room for leave the room for desert. Leave room for the desert. It is our chef special today, suggested the waiter. Yvonne could see the people at the next table eating chocolate cake. Everybody else had finished their lunch and had gone now from the empty room. Yes, pleased, she said eagerly. She had gotten over her fit about the extra vodka. Okay, Grey Goose is made in France. Okay, you know what? That's fair. Actually, yeah, my dad drinks Grey Goose. That's fair. Electrochemistry is the best person to ask about that. Anyway, and Ciroc, too. Interesting. Well, I learned something today. Put up that little, the more you know, rainbow star thing. Uh, let's see. 
Right, leave the room for the, leave room for the desert. It is our chef special today, suggested the waiter. Yvonne could see the people at the next table eating chocolate cake. Everybody else had finished their lunch and gone now from the empty room. Yes, please, she said eagerly. She had gotten over her fit about the extra vodka. The waiter walked away. Excuse me. Now, back to back to talking about Bruce, said Penelope Urbane, brushing a strand of red hair out of her eyes. I hope he will recover soon from his accident. Do not worry about that, exclaimed Yvonne. He is getting, period, the finest medical care money can buy. And if the accident leaves a scar, he can go to a plastic surgeon and has it removed. I know a very good plastic surgeon in Atlanta. He did my nose for me last year, she argued. Penelope wiped a teardrop from the corner of her of her lovely almond-shaped eyes. Uh, sure, yeah, whatever. I do not know what I would do without Bruce if something happened to him. You say Stephen's suffering likes me, but I do not think I could go for a masseuse if something happened and Bruce dies. Yvonne Perrin got angry. You are a snob, Penelope Urbane, she shouted angrily. The crowd of people eating at the restaurant of the Polo Club put down their knives and forks and stared at them. I am not, retorted Penelope in reply. You do not deserve the love of a man like Bruce Lucen. He is the absolute most eligible bachelors in Atlanta, and another one is Stephen Suffern, Yvonne pointed out heatedly. We've been friends for a long time, Penelope said wistfully. I do not want us to fight over men. You are right, sighed Yvonne. Let us not talk about this again, waving her hand to attract the waiter. I will pay for lunch today. The waiter stated, Yes, missus, what would you like? I would like the bill, said Yvonne firmly. That will be $134 plus tax, responded the waiter. Put it on my tab. I am a member of the Polo Club, said Yvonne grandly. Ah, man. There's, this conversation is going through so many variable emotional states in such a short period of time that I'm actually kind of getting whiplash. Oh, we have an image. Hang on a second. There we go. <laughs> Are you dead, son? <laughs> nice. Uh, you're doing the Lord's work there. Penelope knew she could not afford the bill like that, but she had her pride. She could not show her up before all the best society in Atlanta. She would never forgive her if she did. I would be glad to pay half, she offered gently. But her friend waved the money away and stood up and began to walk to the door. I will make up for it when I get that massage from Stephen Suffern, she exclaimed. Stephen is a real stud, and I am looking forward to it, she added eagerly. <laughs> oh, just the eagerness of it. Just Oh, man. Yvonne could not do anything more. She decided to go home and seize Bruce. Okay, is Yvonne going home or Penelope going home? But she was glad they had such a good discussion and cleared things up between them. <laughs> uh, well, that's just that's just the meme format. That's that that is fairly common. But yeah. Anyway, <phone rings> chapter four. Andrew Venice parked his car out in the street in front of the house and double-checked the address he had written down on a slip of paper. Yeah, this was the place, all right. It was or it was an ordinary house on an ordinary street. There was nothing special about it, just plain. Nothing here looked like it might be connected to murder or assault or anything like that. Richard Isaacs, the man he'd come to interview, were a stock manipulator, and you'd think he'd live in a fancier place, a nicer house, on a better street. But since he was also a police informant, maybe he wanted to keep a low profile, not do anything to stand out. Not exactly like the Witnesses Protection Program, but not all that different. Or maybe he just wasn't that good at manipulating stocks. Venice would try to find out, in addition to finding out what he really came here to ask about. <laughs> Uh, he put the note on the front seat and his sunglasses in the glove compartment, checking his reflection in the rearview mirror and smoothing back his hair. Turning 40 was hard. Oh God, I'm feeling that. He didn't know what he'd been planning to do at 40, but he was damn sure this wasn't it. I'm also feeling that. Oh well. It was his job, and he was the one to do it. He'd better get going, ask his questions, make his report. Then he'd have, to st then he'd have time to stop by the gym later, work out a bit fight off the ravages of time. He was still in his prime, even if he had to work harder to maintain it. Yeah, seriously. Like, this is... This is getting a little judgmental here. 
getting out of the car, he looked both ways, then shut the door and used the key fob to lock all the doors. It wasn't a bad neighborhood or anything like that, but he still didn't want to take any chances. He let a minivan go past, then an SUV. Then he walked around the front of his car and up the long sidewalk to the porch. A bench sat on the porch, the kind you might sit on and drink some lemonade, but it didn't look used, like nobody had nobody had, had any lemonade to drink there for a while. Or maybe they just didn't like the porch or something. <laughs> Uh, the or something there got me. Just... Just very stream of consciousness text. And actually, that emptied my first drink. So I will get a refill. I will be right back. Okay, and we are back. Now... Fortunately slash unfortunately, that is the end of the margarita mix, so I'll probably be switching to beer if I finish this drink, and I expect to at some point. Ah, uh, yes. Some fine drinking choices in chat tonight. Anyway, uh, where did I leave off? Yes, right. Uh, Ben sat on the porch, kind of might sit and drink some lemonade, didn't look used like nobody had any lemonade to drink there for a while, or maybe, there you go, or maybe just didn't like the porch or something. Isaac's probably had to keep a low profile anyway. All right, let me read back. I'm trying to figure out what exactly here. Richard Richard Isaacs, right. That's the guy that Andrew Venice is here to interview. I'm assuming he's a detective of some sort. Isaacs probably had to keep a low profile anyway. He wasn't the kind of guy who spent a lot of outside a lot of time outside making friends with the neighbors. Hey, tea's fine too. I'm I'm getting used to that evening tea. Particularly in the weeknights. Just a little something to help help take the edge off the day. Hydration is very important. Anyway, Venice went to knock on the door and stopped. There was a flyer lying on the welcome mat. No, it was one of those bags of advertisements they paid neighborhood kids to, kids to deliver. One of those circulars. There was a cardboard box full of them just off to the side of the door. He picked up the new one and held it in his hand as he knocked on the door with his knuckles, loud enough so that anyone inside could hear him, but not pounding or anything like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tea and honey is a winning combo. Every, if you got a sore throat or something, that will that will help a fair bit. Uh, watching his reflection in the storm door, smoothing, smoothing the lapels on his suit jacket. Oh, God, I th think I'm getting hiccups here. I'll have to be careful about that. Smoothing the lapels on his suit jacket so he'd be sure to look nice, the door opened. Richard Isaacs were the man who answered the door. He looked over Venice, wondering who this guy was at his door and what he was doing there. Venice got into his pocket and pulled out his wallet, flipped it open to show hid badge. She always bring back a bottle of Havana Club as thanks for watching the dogs. I don't drink often. Ooh, nice. Oh, man. That would be cool. I w yeah, going to, going to Cuba would be cool. That's, that's very, very good of her. Anyway, uh, right. Hi, my name is Andrew Venice, he said cheerfully, like there was nothing unusual about him showing up there in the middle of the day. I'm here, I'm here to ask you a few questions. It's no big deal. That was just what Venice wanted him to think, Isaacs thought. They always said it was no big day they always said it was no big deal when they were trying to nail you. I found this lying outside your door, Andrew said. You want it? What was this guy trying to do? Be friendly with him? Be friendly to him? No, just toss it there into the circular file, Isaacs pointed. Toss it into where? That box right there beside the door, he said, pointed to the box. He was getting mad. It's not a circle, it's more of a square, said Venice. Or a rectangle, maybe. It's a joke, right? Now Isaacs, Isaacs was really, really mad. I put the circulars in the circular file. But that crazy Venice guy just offered it again. You sure you don't want it? They got good deals inside. Could save you some money. I, I, I think Venice is... He is a video game protagonist with a dialogue tree, and he is picking the, like, crazy options here. He's picking the options to try to, like, get him off his guard. Anyway, uh, just throw it away. I wish the kids would stop delivering them. Hey, listen, said Venice, sticking his hands into his pockets. I don't have all day here, which is why I spent so much time screwing around with some, like, mail, mail delivery flyer thingy. I'm on an investigation. I came to ask you some important questions, and I want some answers. Wild card, exactly. Yeah. I don't have to answer anything you ask, Richard Isaacs replied forcefully. He wanted to make a point. Are you going to stay out there on the porch and scare off all the neighbors, or are you going to come inside? I'll come inside and ask you my questions there. I want to ask you about Margaret Eastman. Isaacs knew he was going to be regretting this later. 
but he said, come inside anyway, even though he didn't want the guy inside. There's some, there is some innuendo you could, you could conjure up from this, but the text, surprisingly, is not going in that direction. But what were you going to do? That's what they expected from you once you got messed up with the police. But he didn't have to play their game. But I thought he did have to play their game, and that's why he has to let the guy in. Venice walked into the living room, not sure what to expect. Something about Isaacs didn't add up right. He was living in a plain house in this plain neighborhood because of frugality, because he was cheap, or th there was some other reason. He couldn't figure Isaac out, like there was something he was hiding. Even though Venice knew he was in his mid-60s, uh, that's one word, there's no space or hyphen or anything. He looked more like a tough guy than a stock market expert. He had broad shoulders and a narrow waist, muscular. His cheeks were ruddy, like he spent a lot of time outside in the sun and wind. Damn genetics. Some people didn't have to work for anything and had it all anyway. He didn't look like a guy who just turned 40 and needed Viagra to get it up anymore. <laughs> Oh God, that snuck up on me. <laughs> we're back to, we're back to the dick. Mm. <laughs> yeah, mail delivery. Come inside. Exactly. Oh God. He didn't look like a guy who had just turned forty and needed Viagra to get it up anymore. <laughs> but Venice wasn't here to feel sorry for himself. He had a job to do, and it was time to do it. Isaac sat down in the brown recycling chair, re reclining chair with a plop. You know what? I'll take a drink. That was me. My bad. Oh, man. Yeah, it, it. I'm not going to judge a person's medical circumstances, but that seems very unusual. He might, you might want to consult a physician about that, uh, Venice. What's this guy's first name? Uh, Andrew. Okay. Might want to talk to a doctor about that, Andrew. Uh, right. Isaac sat down in the brown reclining chair with a plop in front of the big screen TV, and he pointed to the couch. Why not just sit down, he suggested. Like a man who meant it? Question mark. Venice wasn't going to let himself be pushed around that way by some inf informant. I think I'll stand. This will take just a few minutes. So get started already. Isaac would be glad when this interview is over so he could watch his football game. You follow the Falcons at all? I'm not really a football fan, said Venice, although he split a pair of season tickets with his brother-in-law, went to half the games. Uh, did he split them 28-3? Oh! oh, man. They're never going to live that down. Never, ever. That will be funny until the end of time. He looked at the TV for a second, trying to spot Bill in the crowd. Bill was married to his little sister, Leslie. He adored Leslie. Bill was a great guy, just the kind of guy he'd rather be spending the afternoon with. Then he thought he sounded. Then he thought he sounded like some wuss for saying that. So we added, "I think the West Coast offense really ought to open things up for Vic, though. They should make the playoffs next year." <laughs> Maybe he too was always just the CEO of Microsoft in the bedroom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, said Isaacs passionately. He loved football. He didn't mind all the damn questions now so much. Not at this Venice character like the Falcons. So you wanted to ask me about somebody, some Mary Maury. Her name is Margaret Eastman. Venice said. His veins turned to ice at the mention of his name, of her name. Things like that shouldn't happen to a young woman like her. Who is she? Isaacs asked. Yeah, who is she? The door to the kitchen slammed open, and in walked the most beautiful woman Venice had seen today. Or maybe in a week. The more he looked at her, the more he thought maybe in a lifetime. But he didn't have a whole lifetime of experience yet. But she was incredibly beautiful. Her eyes burst with curiosity. Or maybe it was jealousy. <laughs> Damn it! Uh, Atlanta Knights, you gotta make up your mind when you're describing people. She was older for a beautiful woman. Maybe 40. Maybe the exact same age as Venice. Like, yeah, Venice is 40. She was wearing a bra under her tight blouse. And she was wearing lipstick, too. And he couldn't help staring at her. Her hair was pretty, too. Like it was made out of silk. Just that kind of shiny. <laughs> yeah, when was the last hot lady I saw? Oh, man. Hey, Monica, we need some privacy to discuss business, says Isaacs. It's just man talk. Nothing you'd be interested in. Aha. Yeah, this is... Oh, this is this is really going to go some places. If it's another woman again, you bet I'm interested in, she said, adjusting her breasts to make them stick out more. <laughs> Uh, 
I mean, that, that that's about how old Z was in Alpha Protocol. She was at least... She was in her early 40s, I believe. Anyway, uh... Right. If it's another woman again, you bet I'm interested, she said, adjusting her breasts to make them stick out more. Venice was still staring at her. He couldn't take his eyes off her. And then she was looking at his eyes, like she was touching herself for him, to be prettier for him. He couldn't believe it. <laughs> Tit counter eight. Yeah, no kidding. Uh... Yeah, yeah, the whole Christmas cake thing. I mean, I'd want a cake after... I would want a cake after Christmas. Come on now. Cakes are delicious. Uh, where was it? Right, I don't know who she is, Isaac said. And he was regretting inviting Yv Venice into the house again. I'm stumbling over her names here now. You sure you don't know anything about her? Venice asked. Monica stared at him, with her lips making a little red pout. If I knew anything about her, you can bet I'd let you know, she said, slapping Isaacs on the top of his head. Well, that escalated quickly. Ow, he said, grabbing the top of his head. He looked at Venice again and said, I said I don't know her or anything about her. She was the nurse at the hospital where Bruce Lucent recovered from his automobile accident, Venice said. She's really beautiful, like you wouldn't believe. She has brown hair. I know you like women with brown hair, you two-timing jerks. She was, Monica said. She was hitting Isaacs on top of his head again, and he jumped up and yelled, Stop that! I said I don't know anything, and I don't know her. This is getting into some kind of, like, sitcom, old married couple fighting stuff going on here. I could show you the pictures, Venice said. He had a lot of pictures of her, but he didn't want to share all of them. Not with this scum. Those pictures are for him. It might help your memory some. Listen, buddies, said Isaac. Uh, Isaac said... You came here, so you take what you get and leave. I said I don't know anything. I don't know nothing. That's all there is to it. Why don't you take me? Monica purred at him. Oh, we're getting some open propositioning here. Hey now, I don't like that, Isaac said. And now he was mad at all of them for ruining his day. He was mad enough to hurt somebody. He'd killed a man before one time with his bare hands. And he'd do it again if he put something in his bare hands like a knife or gun or something he could kill something with. <laughs> Yeah, he could kill someone with his bare hands if you put a weapon in those bare hands. Uh, I'll bet he was a Navy SEAL, too. Mm. Venice sensed trouble ahead, but he wanted to see more of Monica. He had the sense, though, that they were just ships passing in the night, that she was some temporary liaison of Richard Isaacs, probably just another cheap tramp or something like all the others. Maybe she could be different, but it wasn't going to be in this lifetime. Not with him. <laughs> Trained in guerrilla warfare. <laughs> Navy walrus. Exactly. You know what? It's like that King of the Hill episode where they briefly thought Bill was part of some plan to create, like, walrus super soldiers or something. Except they shot him up with a placebo instead of any actual, like, combat drugs. Uh, right. Maybe she could be different, but it wasn't going to be in this t lifetime. Not with him. Well, if you don't know anything, guess I'll be going. He said. <laughs> or something count. Nice. Walking down the sidewalk, the car waited for him at the curb. He stopped before opening the door and looked back up at the house. He saw Isaac standing in the window frame, looking back at him. Somebody was hiding something here, but Venice knew he was a bulldog. He'd get to the bottom of it yet. And it didn't matter who got hurt along the way, on the way, because he was going to find out he was going to find out the answers. Okay, so literally nothing happened here. Like, Venice went to interview this guy, asked if he knew Margaret Eastman, and he knew nothing He, he knew nothing at all, and that's the chapter. We're on chapter five now. There she was. The pretty, ner the pretty nurse Stephen had seen... Oh, we're back at the... We are back at the masseuse now. Had seen while he was visiting Bruce Lucent in the hospital. It had just been luck, because he'd stepped out of Bruce's hospital room, thinking about Bruce's ass. A nice, tight ass, what he'd seen here. Okay, uh, Stephen... Uh, uh, Stephen is by at the very least. That, that has to be what's going on here. Her hospital uniform, so loose, uh, so low, so loose on some of the nurses, was tight on her. It highlighted her ass, and her other assets, too. Even loose green scrubs couldn't hide those breasts, spraying at the fabric like they wanted to break free. Stephen licked his lips and rubbed his hands together. He stayed to go being about nothing. Exactly, yeah, that this whole thing is if Seinfeld was about Atlanta socialites. Women like his hands, they said, and men. He made more money than all the other masseuses at the, at the polo club. Tips from people who appreciated his hands. 
yeah, th this is th this is a guy that does not limit himself in client t clientele, no matter what the text said earlier. Hey, he hissed, and got her attention. She looked him up and down, taking in how his shirt strained over his sculpted abs, how the front of his tight jeans bulged, how his hair hung sexily over his eyes. <laughs> Damn it. Ugh. Sexily. Uh, I'm not even on page 30 of this yet. What's the time, Matt? Hour 20? <laughs> God. I mean, it's like sand. It's coarse. Gets everywhere, and I hate it. Exactly. Atlanta is a point of view, Anakin. Anyway, she smiled. Those sexy eyes sparkled. Those rosy lips pouted. I saw you at the hospital, she said. You came to see Mr. Lucent. Excellent memory, he congratulated. He knew his smile, lit up dark brown his eyes, accented his, chan his tan cheekbones, like the rest of you. She blushed, and the warm rush of color colored her face and neck and on down into her cleavage. His eyes followed where it led, and she saw him staring down her shirt. She seemed to like it. Buy me a drink? Bars this close to the hospital had people drinking to forget what horrible sicknesses their loved ones had been sitting in them. There weren't very, they weren't very good places to start romances. So after one drink, Stephen queried, "Let's go somewhere else. This place is depressing. It's raining out. It's raining outside." She moved closer to him, like he could keep her warm in the rain. "I'll keep you warm," he promised. <laughs> uh, thanks for the head, bad eyes. Uh, we might actually get a sex scene in this. Who knows? Uh, that's what she wants to hear. She leaned closer on the bar stool. He looked around at the sad people with their drinks, but no one met his eyes, so he leaned down and played with a piece of her sleek brown hair. I'm Stephen, he explained, after a little while, when she didn't say anything. Do you ever try to forget things, Stephen? The sexy nurse asked him. All the time, but I didn't forget you. You are not forgettable. <laughs> uh, drink it up, thank you, Zero. She turned her head around and smiled at him. That smile made her look younger, like she was a teenager. It was pretty, with straight white teeth. She didn't wear much lipstick, but he liked it that way. Probably for her job. I'm Margaret. I didn't forget you, either. Even though it was two days ago at the hospital, you were easy to remember. He smiled lazily at her, glad that he worked out, because it must be his abs and his muscles that made him so easy to remember. Their faces got closer together. He was looking at her in the dim light from the bar, ignoring the jangling music. It was noisy in here, and the stank of beer and other things he didn't want to think about. So he thought about her, looking down at her like this. Her shirt gaped open more. Mm. Excuse me. I think it's supposed to be gaped, but it's gapped with two Ps. <laughs> you know what? That'll probably make the exercise easier. I can definitely manage push-ups, crunches. I, I, honestly, I... I my hand-eye coordination has not yet suffered. I don't think the exercise will be an issue. Anyway, looking down at this, looking down at her like this, her shirt gapped open more, and he could see the top of her bra, those big, jiggle breasts so close to him. They were making his jeans uncomfortable. Let's forget what you want to be... Let's forget what you want to a fogey, then, Stephen encouraged. He, she smiled a little bit, and those rosy red lips parted. Her teeth shone like perfect pearls in the dim light. He wanted to taste those lips. She closed her eyes and tipped her head back some more. That was his cue, he could tell. So he pushed his lips against hers. <laughs> tree pose. Uh, what's tree pose? Yoga, huh? I gotta Google this. Pretend to be in tree, no man's land, so you don't get shot. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of where my mind's going. I'll just do some crunches, why not? Yeah, no, I can do a lot of things. Balance probably isn't one of them at the moment. And yeah, I feel you, Octal. It's when you haven't done it in a while, you you can feel your body crying out in extreme reluctance to engage with this activity further. Anyway, that's earned a drink by itself. Mm. 
Right. Uh, let's see. That was his cue. He could tell, so he pushed his lips against hers. Right. Okay, so he's kissing the nurse at the bar. Got it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Feeling the alcohol burn. Her lips were warm and soft and tasted like breath mints. It was good. She sighed a little bit, and he thought she would pull away then, but she didn't, so he made the kiss better. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> we can improve it. We have the technology. Mm. Oh, man, that's annoying. Yeah. Wii Fit was good. I I don't have my... I My Wii has long since given up the ghost, unfortunately, but that was fun while it lasted. That was, that was good times. Anyway, uh, so we made the kiss better. He ran his tongue along those perfect teeth. The feeling made him more sure he wanted to get her out of this bar. This isn't a very good place to kiss, he stated. But it was a very good kiss, she exclaimed dreamily. He paid the bill, then put a sweater around Margaret's shoulders. Wait her, he mentioned meaningfully. I'll bring my car around. Man, that sentence was a journey. His Miata, bright red like like her lips. I, I, I don't know what... I, I, Miata has to be a car or something. Sparkled with raindrops like diamonds in light from the street lights. Margaret giggled whilst she held the, swe her, the sweater over her head and led her out of the to the car. She giggled while he held the sweater over her head and then led her out of the car. It's it, a Mazda. Okay, that's probably what it has to be. <laughs> Climb in, fair princess. He chuckled, holding the door open. Oh God, we're we're getting some uh we're getting some tips Vidora action here. And also, he chuckled, comma, holding the door, comma, open. <sighs> wow. Soon that sexy nurse was sitting close to him on his sculpted, dark blue velvet sofa. The lava lamp glowed on her face. Oh, man, this is... We're really having some kind of, like, 70s bachelor pad, except this has got to be set sometime in the... This has got to be set sometime in the 90s, I think. I honestly don't know. It's kind of hard to tell. The lava lamp glowed on her face. Blues made her look mysterious. Red, reds shouted, Sex! Her eyes were deep pools of mystery. He put in a DVD. Yeah, the, the DVD, we gotta be like late 90s, early aughts. That his last girlfriend had said was sexy. The room, the music filled the room with drum beats like heartbeats and a rhythm like to people on pink. <laughs> Uh, a Mazda Miata. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I'm sorry. Hey. Thank you, chat, for correcting me. And <laughs> rhythm like to people humping. <laughs> Let me give you a massage, he said. I give really good massages. I'm waiting, she turned her back to him. And he laid his hands on that sexily slender neck. I need to pull your shirt up. Mm-hmm. He started to massage the tight muscles of her back. She was so tense, but he could fix that. A little oil, patchouli, down to her slender waist, then her voluptuous hips. Eased tension, and he could smell her reaction, even over the oil. Yes, she was ready. He turned over, massaged those breasts, D-cups at least, with his... <laughs> okay, with his scented, like, SC3, ented fingers. There's a three in the word scented. <laughs> of all things, that was, that's what gets me. Uh, he turned over, massaged his breast, D cups at least, with his three ented fingers. Did he take off her bra? Did she? And who undid her skirt? All he knew was that her muscles softened and her tension went away under his skilled fingers, and then her muscles tightened again as she pulled frantically at the zipper of his jeans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You can smell her reaction. He was typing "leet." You know what? Yeah, th this is this is this is early two thousands. We are in the not quite the early days of the internet, but we are early into the ubiquity of the internet. And you would act. This dude is absolutely like. He, he he was probably playing like like team like original Team Fortress, and that's that is his formative experience. 
Anyway, uh, that's when, that was when he pushed his fingers into her yielding brown hair and pulled her face to his. Their tongues met like wild beasts, their dance ageless and timeless. You have a hell of a body, she exclaimed into his mouth. So do you, he moaned. Even if she was older than I, she was still hot. Well, you know, at least he's accepting. His raging manhood was bursting at the seams of his jeans, and so he undid the zipper she couldn't. She was moaning, lying on the soft velvet of the sofa, completely abandoned to his will. God, I almost fucking lost it there. As they came together, he thought how much better this woman, who was experienced and sexy and had been patting on all the right places, was to make love than to the teenagers who threw themselves at him for his body. <laughs> Jesus. God. Ugh, I can't take this. <laughs> like, the Eye of Archon was at least, like, just silly and written from the perspective of a 17-year-old trying to make barbarian fiction. This is professionals intentionally trying to break my brain, and they, they're they they're winning. <laughs> they're, Travis T. is winning the war on my brain. <sighs> okay, uh, where was I? They writhed together like wild beasts on the velvet, somehow moving to the deep shag on the floor. Yeah, yeah, that's... My mind's going to Austin Powers for a minute there at the word shag. His hands, still oily, massaged her ass as he moved inside her. She panted against his chest. She breathes, getting more and more agitate. Thank you, Zero. That's Head pad is extremely necessary right now. Stephen, sh Stephen could tell she was getting really into this. She was really getting into this. He was turning her on. So he got faster and faster. And finally, she screamed, Henry, and went limp under him. Oh, well, we have a plot twist here. Her waves of passion set off Stephen's, and her passion pumped him dry. She lay with her head on his chest, looking up into his eyes. The light from the lava lamp was purples and golds now. Purple and gold. The colors of passion. It shone on her face, damp with sweat from their wild sex. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> mm. The purple made her glazed brown hair look like some exotic African princess, naked and willing. After a few minutes, he started again. Stephen was tired the next day, because he and Margaret had made love more than one time. First in the living room, then in the bedroom, then in the bathroom, in the shower. Then he took her home, and they'd held hands like little kids and kissed outside her door. He couldn't remember any woman or boy... Okay, hold on a second. Any woman or boy. This is... This is painting a very specific picture of Stephen's target audience, as it were. I mean... You know what, never mind. He couldn't remember any woman or boy as hot as she was. None of those teen hyphen agers had ever been like this. He defiantly wanted to see her again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one thrust two minutes later, exactly. It's it, it's time delayed, you know? They're doing they're doing tantric sex, that's what it's about. Anyway, he was giving a massage to one of his regulars at the polo club, and a guy named Isaac Stevens. Stephen wasn't interested in Stevens. Oh god, this is going to confuse things. Because the guy was too old. Besides that, he had Margaret on his mind. But he must have yawned too many, one too many times. Late night last night, wondered Stevens. His voice was kind of muffled by the table he was laying face down on. Oh yeah, Stephen muttered dreamily. He wished it was Margaret's back he was massaging right now. Or maybe somebody, somebody else he could get a quickie in. Dude, damn, this dude's horny. Thinking about Margaret was making Stephen hard. She must have been something, St Stephen. Stevens guffawed wickedly. Or was it a he? It was a girl, no a woman. Not just any woman. The best I ever met, enthused Stephen. Stevens wriggled on the massage table. He was probably getting hot, thinking about Stephen's night last night. Does she have a name? Or are you keeping her all to yourself? You know those centerfolds of, like, naughty nurses? I think they're all true. That's what she is. A nurse. At the Atlanta General Hospital, right across town. Stevens mused. Every time I ever went to the hospital, the nurses would hardly talk to me. Must be? Like, must be? I, I guess... 
I don't know. I feel like that thought just stopped right there. Probably. Steven's, Steven's mind was not in the conversation. Okay, I have to point out something here. So we have Steven, the masseuse, and Isaac Stevens, the guy b getting the massage. And because they're occasionally forgetting to, punk to uh, put an apostrophe in Steven, apostrophe S, it's hard to tell whether we're talking about the masseuse or the guy getting the massage. This... This this is actually hurting my mind here. This is I am taking psychic damage from this. Steven's mind was not on the conversation. It was on Margaret. He could tell she did like his abs and his ass the way she had gripped it. Well, does she have a name? Steven said one more time. Question mark. Oh yes, Margaret Eastman. He drew the name Margaret out. Okay, there's another quotation mark. He. Uh, right, he says, oh yes, Margaret Eastman, space, space, quotation mark, and then starts the sentence that's not him speaking. He drew the name Margaret out like a kiss. Margaret. Yeah, this is, this, this is deliberate. And we got a whole blank page here before the next chapter. Chapter 6. Bruce rubbed the thick foam collar around his neck with his good hand. The stupid thing itched badly, and he knew, he knew it looked darkies, but the surgeon had insisted that he must wear it W A R E constantly for the next six for the next month or suffer the consequence. At least it kept his neck warm in the frigid air conditioning in this restraint. He followed Isaac Stevens, who followed the waiter around past the side entrance and between tables and a booth at the back. Bruce stomped his cane down at a lady's foot in one of the tables and she swore at him. Damn stupid gimp. Whence watch out where yes going with that damnable misbegotten horse and stupid cane, you damn idiots. <sighs> that sentence feels like it was written by some kind of bot trying to come up with, like, regional slang. Like, that is... <sighs> right, moving on. Gaseous, you old bat, he howled. Watch your own feet and keep them out of the way so I don't trip over them. Don't you know who I am? Give me any more trouble and I'll have your ass arrested so far your false teeth, teeth will pop out of your head. Uh, yeah, I don't think that's how that works, Bruce, but sure, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is going to be a zero morale stream. This is going to be <laughs> Thank you Zero. Appreciate that. Yeah, that that restores my that restores my morale. I'm back in now. I got this. Three waiters hurried over. I'm so sorry, Mr. Lucent, small L. They sniveled. One of them turned on the old lady and shouted, "Backs off, you. That's Mr. Lucent and he owns half this town." Another waiter spoke up and yelled, "Why he owns more than more than half of this here Trotter's Corners, and that's a fact." They gathered around her and knocked her out of her chair, then kicked her a few times to teach her a lesson. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that's funny. Like, uh. like, yeah, some software developer owns half of Atlanta. Atlanta, famous hub of IT and technology. Like, it's just... All of a sudden, they're just, like, going to town on this lady just for arguing with this guy. Oh. Bruce limped on after Stevens, leaving the waiters to handle the women. It was stupid people like that who had inspired him to climb to the top. He didn't ever want to be stuck with riffraff like that, so he'd use the computer skills he had learned from cracking PlayStation games. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'm on page 36. That's PlayStation, two words, neither capitalized. He had used the computer skills he had learned from cracking PlayStation games and writing viruses on the internet to build his company to a person was today. Okay, so he's like... Writing viruses and so he's a pirate. He he's he's not a software guy. He's a pirate. He was doing ransomware back in like two thousand. We're not even in Bitcoin anymore. This guy's just stealing shit. 
<laughs> Maybe it was a literal PlayStation. Possibly. A giant among software development companies. Not bad for a guy just out of his teens. Oh, God. He bumped another table with the cast on his leg, but the people there cringed. Sorry, Mr. Lucent. One declaimed. Okay, I've never heard declaim before, but... I hope that didn't hurt you. No, he offered magnanimously. I'm okay. Okay, so yeah. He, he hit his cane on an old lady's foot, and because she yelled at him, he sicked the waiters on her, but bumped another table, and everyone there is just... Yeah, yeah, I can't. I can't. I just can't. <sighs> Moving on. He limped across to their booth and slid in across from Stevens. So what did you want to talk to me about? He growled. Let's have a drink first and get something to eat, soothed Isaac. That dumb old lady seems to have set upset you. So let's relax for a while and then we'll talk about business. Suits me fine, offered Bruce. Suits me and fine are all capitalized. He turned to the waiter. I'll have a Shirley Temple screwdriver with Absolute Vodka on the rocks. Okay, it's not Absolute the brand, it's Absolute with U-T-E at the end. It's just, like, definitely vodka. I'll have a Shirley Temple screwdriver with definitely vodka. Yes, sir, exclaimed the waiter. And you, Mr. Stevens? Sprays burn on the rocks with a little Pepsi. A good single malt needs a little sweetening. I prefer Mountain Dew with my single malts, quibbled Bruce. Or maybe prune juice. It's more natural somehow. <laughs> yeah, certainly vodka. Exactly. My daughter, Irene, likes it with root beer, but she's a little weird, chuckled Stevens. He rubbed his pepper and salt beard, then brushed back his clothes trimmed hair. I heard about your accident at the polo club. Guesses you're lucky to be alive. Henry Archer went off the road on the same curve a few nights later in his Humvee, but he didn't survive. The cop said someone had dumped a bunch of used oil on the shoulder near there. That might have been what got you and Henry. Could be. I was only doing 95. Oh, oh yeah, only only doing 95 miles per hour. But I slid off right when I got there. Had to throw away the boxer shorts. Oh. What? Okay, that, that must be they, the hospital got rid of them. Whatever. Had to throw away the boxer shorts I was wearing. They were nice ones, too. Glow-in-the-dark green with luscious red lips printed all over the house. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Glow-in-the-dark green boxer shorts with luscious red lips printed all over them. <laughs> what in the hell? <sighs> I miss those shorts, whined Bruce. He scratched his crotch where his leg cast rubbed and itched. The waiter returned with their drinks. He set them down and then set a big foaming mug of beer in front of them, each of them as well. Compliments of the house, sirs. Mr. Gronoman said you two looked a little thirsty. Yeah, seriously. Like, if you're wearing one of those... Like... The lips all over them is tacky, but whatever. Guys have dumb shit on the boxers all the time, but glow in the dark? Like, you need therapy at that point, man. You need an intervention. You need your friends and family to corner you at your house one day, holding the shorts up and say, Listen, Bruce, we're worried about you. This We were willing to tolerate your fashion habits so far, but this is just this has gone way too far. We're, we're taking action here. Anyway, uh, right. Uh, right, Mr. Gronemont said you two look a little thirsty. Great, said Isaac. Nothing like a cold, frosty mug of heavy, dark beer to go with my single malt. Helps wash away the taste. What will you gentlemen have for lunch? Quarried the waiter? Question mark. Isaac rubbed his pepper and salt beard. I feel like they're mentioning that again. Then brushed back his clothes trimmed hair. Okay, th uh, uh, am I going crazy or did they say that exact thing phrase twice? Like, okay... Yeah, yeah, okay, he, they're doing this, the sentence again. Like, earlier on, he rubbed his pepper and salt beard, then brushed backs, B, backs, B-A-C-K-S, his clothes trimmed hair. And now again, Isaac rubbed his pepper and salt beard, then brushed backs, his clothes trimmed hair. Yeah, exactly. You know what? If they're SpongeBob boxers, I will tolerate that. That is acceptable. Uh, drink time, thank you. Mm. Right. All right, let's start with... Uh, oh, man. 
We leave off right, right, right. Here we go. Let's start with pate de foie gras and caviar and a basket of crackers to spread them on. Triscuits, wheat thins, stuff like that. Oh yeah, this is a real classy club. This is a real classy socialite club that has triscuits there, and some stuffed mushrooms and truffles on the side, and a couple triple deck chocolate mocha latte to drink. He might be fifty now, but he can still pack it away. Nothing that a good few pounds of racquetball and polo wouldn't burn back off. Too bad Bruce was all knocked up. Uh, I, I have to assume that's some, like, slang. Okay, I'm looking at the rest of this, and none of this makes sense. Okay, too bad Bruce was all knocked up. Bruce had such a studly body, rock-hard abs, and massive shoulders from working out and weightlifting, but he was starting to get just a little pudgy since the accident. Okay, my understanding was that Bruce was overweight, and that was part of the concern with Penelope, and, but now they're saying he's, like, fucking ripped here, and he's only just, like, slightly put on weight. I, I, I cannot track these character descriptions at all. This is, con this is deeply confusing. Repeated phrases. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, th th this... I, I had to be sure that actually happened, and that wasn't me remembering it happened through the phase of n going on nearly two whole margaritas at this point. Anyway, he was... Uh, he was starting to get a little pudgy since the accident. Isaac had seen him in the locker room of the gym. Kid was pretty well hung, too. <laughs> just... Guys here just... Paying attention to, to, to just encouraging each other in their dick sizes. And, I mean, yeah, the, the, the whole point is that it's bad on purpose. And... Somehow this book got a publishing deal before they realized, before they revealed it was a scam or a hoax. Like it's intentionally a shit post, basically. Cause yeah, the the story at the start was some publishing house posted a couple articles that were like ripping the sci-fi and fantasy genre. So a bunch of writers got together and submitted an intentionally bad manuscript. Managing to get it published, and then they revealed that it was a, that it was intentionally shit. So yeah, the, the joke is that it even in knowing that this is bad, I'm just not prepared for this fucking thing. Someone considered this seriously. Uh, right. Isaac had seen in the locker room at the gym. Kid was pretty well hung too. Yeah, the kid in his fifties. Probably had chicks throwing themselves themselves at him all the time. He'd better stay away from Isaac's daughter, Irene Stevens, though. Kid was making a lot of money with his software development company, too. And Isaac wanted a piece of that. If he could buy his way in now, he might sit, be sitting real, really pretty in a few more years. I like some artichoke hearts and pickled eggs, too, mused Bruce Lucent. And make sure there's plenty of whipped cream in my latte. Yes, sir, exclaimed the waiter. He hurried off to do their bidding in the kitchen. Bruce rubbed his rock-hard abs. I'm getting a little pudgy with all this inactivity since the accident, he mused. Okay, there's there's no quotation in there. There's just text. I'll really have to work hard to get back in shape once I'm better. A good thing that shrapnel just nicked my thigh rather than cutting higher, or I might be singing a little higher. Wouldn't want to, question mark, disappoint the ladies. Yeah, it was a vanity publisher that would publish pretty much anything. Exactly. And credit where it's due... If they were able to pass this off as literature enough, then I would say the point was well made. That's they uh, apparently the publishing house was accused of like tossing most of its manuscripts and not really looking all that closely, so the selection was kind of arbitrary. And that this got past the gate was pretty solid evidence of that. Anyway, the sunlight was very warm on his face and side from the window, and he wondered if he was going to start sweating. Fire and ice, he thought to himself. Too cold air conditioning and too hot sun. I'm being frozen on one side and roasted on the other. I'll be shivering and sweating at the same time. Okay, dude, you're sitting in the sun. This is not exactly, uh, this is not exactly extreme weather conditions here. Isaac will think I've got a fever. Fire and ice. Ice cream and jalapeno. Ice and water, ice water and steam. Cold and hot. Freezing on one side and roasting on the other. He fled uncomfortable, like he had the flu and had a fever. Oh, almost lost it there. Okay, it, he, he, it has to be he felt uncomfortable. Because, yeah, he fled uncomfortable, but he's still at the table. It's kind of chilly here, commiserated Isaac. How come you look so hot? It's this sunlight, groaned Bruce. I'm boiling on one side and freezing on the other. 
The waiter brought their appetizers and set them in front of them. More beer, he queried. It's on the house. Sure, quipped Bruce and Isaac together. The waiter refilled their mugs. Hot enough for you? He quipped. Yes, shivered Bruce. I'm boiling on one side and freezing on the other. Like fire and ice. <laughs> Try the cold beer, offered the waiter. That should help cool you down some. Isaac rubbed his pepper and salt beard, then brushed back his close trimmed hair. <laughs> oh, uh, of all things, that's what gets me. Here's the further success with your company, he enjoined. Bruce returned the toast, and they clanged their frosty mugs of dark beer together. Then Van swilled large mouthfuls down. Ah, declaimed Bruce. That was good, cold. They tucked into the appetizers. There was pâté de foie gras, and caviar, and stuffed mushrooms, and truffles, and artichoke hearts, and pickled eggs, and crackers, and they washed it down. All, they washed it all down with cold, frosty, dark beer in foamy mugs and sipped their latte that they were sharing because obviously these two men were lovers. Also, that whole description reminds me of Half-Baked when the guys are, like, sending... Uh... uh the... I forget, the, I forget the actor's name. The guy's name is Kenny in there. They're sending Kenny to go get food, and they give this, like, really, really long list of things that he goes and gets and somehow remembers despite being stoned off his ass and that he feeds it to a police horse and dies and ends up in jail. Long story. Very dramatic. Very moving film, that one. Anyway. Uh, ah, exclaimed Bruce. That was really good. How about some real food now? Oh, yes, agreed Isaac. Some real food would really hit the spot right now. Waiter, I'd like a half pound of rare T-bone steak smothered in mushrooms and onions and a baked potato with cheese and sour cream and bacon bits and steamed baby carrots and corn on the cob. Yeah, th this is it. This is this, this is fucking... These dudes are stoners. This is what's going on here. These guys got the munchies. Yes, sir, exclaimed the waiter. And you, Mr. Lucent? I'll have a roasted chicken stuffed with truffle and can cranberry dressing, a baked potato with butter and sour cream, and a side of some baby back ribs. Okay, you're not eating all this on a regular basis and still having and still having abs to brag about. Like this dude, <sighs> whatever. Yes, sir. He declaimed. We're using declaimed a lot instead of exclaimed. And I feel like they snuck that in at some point. Like, the prose is getting worse. They're using words that either don't exist or are so rarely used that the average reader would trip over them. And I think that's it. that's got to be intentional just so they can say, listen, this is the shit you allowed. This is the shit you were willing to publish. Uh, let's see. Bruce scratched at his neck brace. Who was that babe I saw with you at the party last week? He simpered. Isaac rubbed his pepper and salt beard, then brushed back his close trimmed hair. God damn it! Oh. That phrase. I'm just gonna be laughing in that phrase now, and it's gonna come up again. I can feel it. Mm. Okay. I, I, I think they did not, is the thing. Like, they just glanced at it, probably read maybe a page or two, and figured, all right, it's some kind of, like, some kind of drama mystery thing going on. Didn't bother reading the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, it, this... This feels like there was some AI input in this. Or some kind of machine learning thing, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I gotta reload. In fact, I'm just gonna grab a beer, because I think one more margarita and I'll probably pass out. I am a notorious lightweight. I'll be right back. Okay, and I'm back. Okay, one more hour. We can do this. <laughs> Man, I'm only on page 40 of this fucking thing. It goes on for 287 pages. Like, forget reading it. How the hell did they write this? How did... I feel like this is, like... This was probably constructed by an SCP or something that compelled them to write it, and... Because I think anyone trying to consciously, willingly come up with this 
rambling, incoherent nonsense would probably take a sanity hit. Like, I imagine some of them just, like, laughing incoherently in a corner and, like, going on about rats in the walls. Exactly. They had to do it in ships. They couldn't... They could not write this in a long burst. They they, they needed to take breaks. They had to. <laughs> Divided amongst themselves, then vaguely connected everyone's parts. You know what? That probably is how they did it. They're like, okay, you take this chapter, you take this chapter. These are the characters we're working with. These are the things we want to include. Go. We're not even going to try to stitch it together. Just go. Okay, that does explain it then. So each chapter was written by a different person. That actually makes a lot of sense. And that explains how we're not just focusing on different scenes, but there's no real continuity between them. I mean, they said as much, but there's there's reading what someone says about this piece, and then there's reading it for myself. And this is, this is an experience. This is raw stream of consciousness madness. Uh, right, where was I? Okay, um... Right. That was my daughter, Irene Stevens. She came to the party with me. Your daughter, inquired, Br inquired Bruce. Wow, she was really hot. I'd surely like to get to know her better. Well, countered Isaac, that might be arranged, as long as things go all right, you understand. Cool, quipped Bruce, who was feeling hot on one side and cold on the other again. Fire and ice. Bruce wanted to get out of all these casts and things first, though. Also, like the guy just casually offering his daughter to the software developer so he can get, presumably, like shares in the company or something and to get all his stitches Bruce wanted to get all the out of all these casts and things first though and to get all his stitches out or maybe not she might be she might feel more compassionate toward him if she saw him this way first and that could lead to more passionate fun later oh there's a play on words for you what a hot babe he could hardly wait to see her with her clothes off they'd start slow maybe a game of strip poker or something classy like that <laughs> Oh god, one of the later chapters is bot written. Oh man. <laughs> yes. Oh, this is perfect. This is high art. This belongs in a museum. Right. They'd start slow, maybe a game of strip poker or something classy like that. And then once they were ready, they could go right for the brass ring. His slacks tightened and he winced as one of his stitches pulled out. <laughs> <laughs> oh god so he got an erection and it pulled out a stitch like didn't he do it with his p girlfriend Penelope earlier <sighs> right his slacks tightened and he winced as one of the stitches pulled out Bruce rubbed his throbbing crotch where the cast rubbed and the stitch had pulled out and his pants were too tight now so, he inquired, question mark, what did you want to talk about? Excuse me. Yeah, exactly, real classy. Isaac rubbed his pepper and salt beard and brushed back. <laughs> uh, it's so dumb. We're on, like, the fifth. Uh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this, this is Bruce, yeah. Um, he is with Isaac Stevens, the 60-year-old guy that the cop interviewed, not Stephen, the masseuse. Oh, uh, God. Uh, actually, I spilled a little, I'll be right back. Harlan Williams! That was it! That was the guy who played Kenny in half Bake. Harlan Williams, I remember that. <laughs> Beer is improving my memory. <laughs> Beer and margaritas. Oh, where was I? Uh, right. Isaac rubbed his beard, pepper and salt beard, then brushed back his close-trimmed hair. Well, he countered, you've been very successful with your software company, and I'd like to talk about that. I really admire a successful man who makes a lot of money, and you're one. <laughs> Exactly. I spilled my drink. I really admire a uh, successful man who makes a lot of money and you're one. Especially as young as you are. To be so successful and making so much money, if you know what I mean. I admire all that. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. 
the money. Yes, agreed Bruce. I am doing rather well, and I enjoy making money. Not the money so much as all the things it can buy, all the wonderful things I can do with it. I own half this town, Trotter's Corner. Now and someday I'd like to own half of Atlanta itself. But you're in Atlanta. Like, yeah, <laughs> spill my drinky. First, I'm going to name this town, though. I'm going to name it Lucentville. Do you hear that, everyone? This town is now Lucentville. And someday Atlanta will be named Lucent City. Everybody cheered, and the waiter brought their food. More beer, capital B, he carried? It's on the house. Sure, they quipped, and dug into their food. Well, chewed Stevens around his steak, and potatoes, and onions, and mushrooms, and corn on the cob. Okay, he chewed around this food. What is he actually eating? I'd like to invest in your company. I'd like to give you a lot of money, so I can have part of your company, and I'll, announce, I'll introduce you to Irene, too. Bruce scratched at his neck brace. Well, he gobbled past his roast chicken and ribs. That sounds quite decent of you. I think I'd like that. And I'm especially looking forward to getting to know Irene Stevens better, if you know what I mean. Wow, was she hot. Fire and ice. They devoured their food and drank more toasts from tall, foamy mugs of ice-cold beer. To Lucentville. The Lucent Software Development Corp. To Irene Stevens. To life. Fire and ice. As they finished their meals, Isaac rubbed his pepper and salt beard and brushed back his closed trimmed hair. I can do it. Yes, the phrase has no power over me. I can hold it back. I'm winning. I'm, I'm, I'm prevailing. I have passed through the valley of madness and I, I have become... I have become greater than I was before. In this moment, I am euphoric. Where was I? Oh yeah, how about some dessert? inquired Isaac. Bruce rubbed his throbbing crotch where the cast rubbed at it against it, and his stitch had pulled out, and his pants were swollen with lust. Dessert would be great, declaimed Bruce. I'm famished. Fire and ice. God. <laughs> I couldn't hold it in. I couldn't hold it in. Ugh. All right, we're at chapter seven. Uh, right. Margaret and Irene sat in silence for 32 minutes, each gathering their thoughts together, each afraid to say the first word, knowing that the first word could lean anywhere, including the truth. <laughs> this reads like some someone who is 16. Yeah, exactly, yeah. This is... This feels like... So, this feels like my... This this feels like some bad fan fiction I would have written when I was 14, but, like, way worse. Like, it's not even trying to string scenes or ideas together. It's just stream of conscious madness. I feel like this is written by... I, I, I feel like I'm experiencing the script for Mulholland Drive, and at some point, I'm going to reach the point where they open the box and the entire movie shifts around and, like, every person is different and you have lost all bearing on who's doing what and why. And there, there, there's going to be something, some moment in there in this writing that just makes me crack. <laughs> Rejoined her in the early years. Exactly. Uh, thank you, Eyes. I appreciate that. Uh, right. Chapter 7. Though the first word could lead anywhere, including the truth. Irene signaled for a latte with one hand and fingered her long blonde hair with the other, twisting it again and again until it spiraled like a golden staircase leading to the top of her head. So she's braiding herself while she's, uh, she's braiding her hair while she's having a latte. When the pain started, she wept, expostulating. I don't know what I'll do without Henry. He was the center of the world. Expostulating. Like, I, I know what a postulate is. I Like, you could, I guess, postulating. I guess you could turn that into a verb, but what the hell is expostulating? I don't know. Even in this, even the center of the world has to die sometime. Oh, Margaret's got a bit of nihilism to her. Margaret sat sideways in her chair, her breasts a pair of protruding alps. He didn't seem like the kind of man who died, Irene said. <laughs> Mm. 
Yeah, yeah, he seemed like some kind of immortal lich. Or lick, I guess. I, 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 I've been saying it lich the whole time. I've heard some people say it lick. Or whatever. Express strong disapproval for dis or disagreement. It's a real word. Wow. Yeah, wow indeed. I had no idea. Huh. I, I learned something today. It's a trope where you thesaurus bash your way around writing said. Yeah, I, I... I mean, obviously we're dealing with an intentionally written shit post, but just, just, just use said. Just don't get clever about the word said. Anyway, uh, he didn't seem like the kind of man who died, Irene said. Sometimes when we were in bed, making love, at the very edge of the surf, where the waves washed over us... Okay, you're in bed... At the edge of the surf, where the waves washed over us again and again. So they, they're in a bed at the beach. That's... I mean, that, that bed's just not going to last you very long. I, I looked at his face and saw something there that not even all the forces of erosion could ever wash away. He was a determined man, and in his position he had to be. And I knew that, too, looking up at him, wanting only for him to be there forever. He was old, you know. He was around in the 70s and everything. But there was an agelessness to him. A beautiful, a beautiful eternal foreverness that shone from him like the light from a lighthouse or like the sunlight from the sun. He made me feel like a child again and I wanted to stay in bed with him, feeling, feeling him warm my world, cooled by the waves that washed over us until the stars went out. <laughs> it's symbolic. <laughs> That's what I expected anyway. That's what he promised. And now he's dead. His heart stopped. Margaret's eyes darted toward Irene in expressive regard. Yes. What am I supposed to do without him? The unanswerable stolidity of the question echoed in the space between them, and there was nothing Margaret could say that would make the other woman feel any better. As a nurse who had been taking care of people about to die, and who had died for longer than... Okay, people about to die and who had died, so it's, it's the people there, for longer than most people could guess, she had spoken to her share of people mourning the death of their loved ones. She had earned a nationwide reputation for her bedside management, as she always knew what to say to make people take the deaths of those they cared for, mo they cared for most, just another part of life that needed to be endured and which would one day be one day feel better. As opposed to the sunlight from Pluto, yeah. Doctors always asked Margaret to help when their patients died. But some deaths were not like other deaths. Some deaths were too much to be borne. Some deaths hit those who were left behind like a bomb exploding in their houses, leaving just rubble behind. Margaret did not know what to say to this spectacularly beautiful woman before her, to make her feel better than the, lo the man she loved more than she loved life itself had been so cruelly taken from her. A tear formed at the corner of her own eye, the left. <laughs> okay, we, we have, in parentheses, the left. <sighs> it's the littlest damn things that get to me now. I'm just, I'm done. <sighs> As she shook her head and said, I don't know. Sometimes we lose the whole reason we're alive. Sometimes we have to go out somehow and find a new reason. A reason not dictated by law or morality or even sense. Some new person to love. Some new way to live. Some new purpose to make the night seems warmer. I think Henry was, Henry was probably the kind of man who knew that if he ever died in a horrible car accident, leaving you behind, that you would find the courage to stand up and move on and climb out of this place where you are. He would not want you to be here now or ever. He would want you at the beach where you were at your best, in the waves, in bed. Okay, yeah, that, that, again, we definitely have a, a bed at the beach. Like, uh, this is killing my soul. One line at a time, this is killing my soul. Maybe Irene swigged her steaming latte in one scalding gulp. Okay, that, that's actually, like, that's actually kind of dangerous. You don't want to chug a latte. Like, if that was served at anything close to a reasonable temperature, that would be a chore to get down. I want to savor that thing, man. And maybe, maybe what? I remember one night, the best night for us. He took me to Rome, where he, where we stood in the light of... 
Okay, he took me to Rome, where we stood in the light of the Eiffel Tower and watched the people go by. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> oh. I wasn't going to laugh at that, but God damn it, that deserves a drink on its own. There was one couple there who reminded us of us. There was another man, Henry's age. Okay, it's Henry's plural, not Henry's possessive. It is Henry's H-E-N-R-I-E-S, not H-E-N-R-Y apostrophe S. So there are multiple Henry's in this in this woman's life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you can see, if you can see the Eiffel Tower from Rome, somebody's pumping some real power into that thing. There was another man Henry's age and another woman at my age. Well, another woman my age, and they were laughing together, just laughing, hard. You know the way people laugh when they really feel the joy of life. The two of them laughing, laughing, laughing till the tears came down the sides of their faces in great cascades. I was a little worried that they would not be able to breathe, but Henry said, "Look at them, Irene. Just look at them. Look at her and look at him. Look at them. The very themes themes of them." You know, it's not just a she and a him, but a them. Two of them together in one unit. <laughs> oh, the very themes of them. You know, it's not a she and a him, but a them. Two of them together in one unit, laughing and laughing here in the city of brotherly love. Uh, okay, Rome is not the city of brotherly love. That's another place entirely. Like, Jesus. <laughs> he started to crack. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is... Presumably someone that actually went to Rome would know if they saw the Eiffel Tower there. But, yeah, if you haven't been, that's another story. But these people have been, they would know. The Vatican, yeah, maybe. Maybe they're at the Vatican. Uh, God, I completely lost my place here. <laughs> uh, okay, in one unit here in the City of Brotherly Love. Okay, uh, again, I have to Google this. I know the City of Brotherly Love refers to something else. I think it's Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. City of Brotherly Love. Uh, it's Philadelphia. That's in Pennsylvania. Oh, God. I mean, unless we're going back to Rome and we're talking that kind of brotherly love. and Like ancient Roman times. That's an entirely different subject. Philly, Philly yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Vatican City. Big LGBTQIA hotspot. That, yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Their last echoing and echoing and echoing up and up and up, drowning out the traffic and the conversations of other tourists and the singing of the Christmas cajoler and even the motor noises filling the world. It was a lot of laughing. And me, remember Harry squeezing... Okay, it, it, it's Henry. It, 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 there's Harry. <laughs> oh, God, we got Hobo Cop in this. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> That's exactly what this needs. Me remember Harry squeezing my hands till the bones hurt and saying, You know, I laughed like that once many years ago when I was a boy, and I don't even remember the joke anymore, but I always wanted to laugh that way again. And sometimes when I, get, when I take a good look at you, I think I have a chance. And I never thought of it again, but he also said that night, You know, honey, I'm much older than you, and that means I'll be dead before you, and it will be worth dying even in a terrible car wreck. This is sublime. This is art. We have reached the level of terrible that Jim Thighs was aspiring to back when he wrote The Eye of Argon. This is what he would do with his future career. 
<laughs> this is what it this is what it was all pointing towards. This is the alpha and omega of terrible fiction. Oh. <laughs> Uh, it'll be so hard to find something that tops this. Okay, uh... And I never thought of it again, but he also said that night, You know, honey, I'm much older than you, and that means I'll be dead before you, and it will be worth dying, even in a terrible car wreck, if it means that between now <laughs> and the moment of that car wreck... <laughs> <laughs> a little, a little crying, yeah. <laughs> God, this is bringing back some Yakuza Zero memories, only even more so. Just like the batshit insanity of that game. This is hitting those same nerves. I'm just... My mind cannot grasp the true form of this thing, and... It is laughing at the shape around it. <laughs> Uh, what, when's the machine written chapter? I will jump to that before we end the stream. If you can figure that out, I will read that. I will end with that. Oh. Right, uh. Okay, it will be worth dying even in a terrible car wreck if it means that between now and the moment of that car wreck, we laugh at least once as hard as that couple walking by just now, though they were long past us by the time he got around to saying that. Chapter 34. Oh, oh, goody, goody, gumdrops. Yeah, we're, we're closing on that. Uh, next week will be Hollow Knight, unfortunately. But I will definitely have to read more of this. This is a journey. Anyway, let us continue. He said, make me laugh like that again, Irene. And I said, surely. But you know, there was always the older man, younger woman thing. And as much as I thought of him as some kind of god, me never once got around to making him laughs. Twisting her hair into a braid using the same finger she'd been using before, she said, And now I will have to live my entire life, however long that turns out to be, knowing that I never gave him what he wanted. I made him come, but could never make him guffaw. <laughs> God damn. Oh. I mean, that's a kind of achievement right there. The sun broke through the clouds, then its brilliant golden husk digging a, a guffaw, like laugh. That's what she was going for. So they had sex, but she never brought him joy. That would be poetic in any other story. We are on chapter 7, I think. Yes. Uh, the sun broke through the clouds, then in its brilliant golden disk burning a hole through the great puffs of water vapor to send a shaft of golden light zigzagging down through the layers of atmosphere and warm the earth in a way that no sunlight since the beginning of time had ever warmed the earth before. Somewhere a child was being born. Somewhere a dog was barking. Life was going on, but in this, in this one moment, at this particular place in time and space, the two beautiful women... The beautiful women, one twisting her hair into knots, the other sitting sideways, were not part of it. Yeah, they were outside the world. They were actually sitting in space. You know, they're, they're, they're like the Kryptonians on the moon in Superman 2. That's what's going on here. They were here only for each other and for the memory of a great man who had walked the earth like a rock in the sand. Yeah, sure. Life is like that sometimes, thought Margaret helplessly. Apparently there are two different chapter 12s and no chapter 21. Oh, this just, this is brilliant. Life is like that sometimes, thought Margaret helplessly. Sometimes it's just an interruption in the day and not part of it. The trick is knowing when it's day and when it's night, and the darkness or li lightness or darkness has nothing to do with telling the difference between them. The death of a man like Henry Archer was definitely night, even if it took place at noon. It was like an eclipse of the world. There must have been people, even in distant primitive villages, who had felt the mo felt the moment he breathed his last. They must have looked up at the night sky, or even the day sky, and said, What was that? Meaning him. Irene lit a cigarette and blew out a huge cloud of smoke. What am I going to do without him? She wailed. What? Margaret had no answer, except for the ones she had already given. Yeah, that that is almost certainly intentional. Hmm. Uh, chapter 8. 
Richard studied the menu like a shark saving a school of a, a school of school of fish while the waiter impatiently tapped his fountain pen across his against his pad. Across the table, he felt Callie's eyes upon him, waiting for him to make up his minds. Yet his mind wasn't on lunch, but upon Callie. He could sense her own impatience with him, as if she was trying to decide whether she wanted to be dining with him at all, or whether she would just be just as happy to be eating by him by herself. Uh, take the filet mignons, he said. Rare, please, and with the garlic mashed potatoes. And to start, hmm, perhaps the New England clams chowder. Yeah, put more than one clam in there, please. He consulted the wine list. And perhaps a bottle of Riesling, please. 1999 vintage. Very good, sir. The young waiter, whose name tag said his name was Frederick, and who sported a pencil-thin mustache, studiously jotted it all down, then turned to Callie. And for you, madam, may I recommend the calamari souffle? It's in season. It's in a season. Yes, I think so, she said stiffly. And a chef's salad to start. But hold the dressing, please. As you wish, madam. You know what? All this is reminding me of just how many times in Endwalker you sit down for a big meal and there's like a long establishing shot of all the like food you've got there, like snacks and burgers and really good looking stuff. Like they do it three or four times if you include like 6.1. Like they just. That expansion was really good about that. It kept making me hungry. That's the impression I get because of how many times we've had people sitting down to have lunch and just ordering half the menu. I know, I know. It was so good. It looked really good. Like, yeah, people meme about the the square grapes, but that burger looked genuinely delicious. Uh, right. As you wish, madam. Frederick clicked his pen, then moved off into the hustle and bustle of the restaurant. Le Bonhomme. I, I, I don't know what this is in French. It's B-O-N-H-O-M-E. It looks like Bonhomme. I'm guessing in French it'd be like Bonhomme. Bonhomme. I, I have no idea how that's pronounced in French. I apologize to any French speakers in the chat. But Le Bonhomme was busy today. Busier than usual. Richard ate here often, usually with other Peachtree Street brokers who he was trying to get info from about deals they were making. Uh, it was one of the best, most fashionable bistros in Atlanta, which is why he liked it so much. The service was superb, and the food was pretty good, too. And so... Bonhomme, yeah. Okay, that, that makes sense. I guess the IE is silent. Bonhomme. Le Bonhomme. You know, that, that sounds right. That's probably correct. Yeah, this feels like a Crichton question. He would know. Anyway, uh, right, the service was superb, the food was pretty good. And so, Richard said, as he unfolded his napkin and laid it daintily across his lap, how are you getting along now that Henry is gone? Callie reached in, Callie reached into her handbag, pulled out a compact. As well as could be expected, I guess, she said, opening it to study her reflection in its mirror. Oh, I miss him so much, but she sniffed, then closed it and tucked it back into her bag. Well, life must go on, you know? Life, mu life must go on. Yes, it does. Okay, is this the same Henry? Because we just had a whole chapter on Irene, and presumably Henry was her husband. Uh, maybe this is her. Maybe this is his daughter. Hmm. Yeah, rip PS2 grapes. What a shame. It's like seeing that rock go away. That they finally. Uh, that was like low textured or something. Everybody gathered around it on the last day before the patch. Life's little moments in Aeorzea. Yeah. Anyway, life must go on, you know. Life must go on. Yes, it does. She wore a black silk dress today. Two words. Low cut. Better to expose the generous mounds of her bosom. Now, we haven't done descriptions of breasts in a while. Callie was a fine-looking woman, Richard had to admit, and the dress left little to his teeming imagination. Her nipples, like the silver dollars he used to collect when he was a kid, pressed against the fabric, arousing him. Yes, it does indeed. Life must go on. Callie observed his interest. She pouted, looking like the Mona Lisa having a bad day. Is there a reason why you asked me to come here, Richard? Then she lowered her voice to a husky contralto. Or should I call you Dick? I, I think that counts for the dick counter. I think that should count. Yeah, dick count 30. Or that unkillable goat. Yeah, exactly. He caught her meeting, found his face, found his livid face turning red. No, he said, 
Richard would be just fine, Callie. I was just admiring your dress. From China, isn't it? Yes, she said. From Hong Kong. Henry took me there many years ago. For one of his boring business trips. I love the shops. I think I must have spent hours in them. Bung things you can't hear in America. That has to be buying, but it says bung. Wow. And he was very generous too. I think I might have maxed out I think I must have maxed out an American Express Platinum card just on clothes and jewelry. Oh, what a trip that was. I can imagine, Richard said. He wondered if the police would be interested in her purchases when she was abroad. He had little doubt many of them had not been declared with US customs. But a woman like her wouldn't have a, a, a woman like her wouldn't have have had much trouble dealing with lowly customs inspectors, now would she? She would have just smiled her and winked and perhaps slipped a hundred dollar bill across the counter, and a horny young customs inspector would have let the rich dame pass. Happens all the time, and it fits you well too, he added. She glowered at him from across the table. You're not here to ask me about my wardrobe, Callie asked. What do you really have on what do you really have on your mind? That's you that's Y O U apostrophe R E U R mind. Really? Oh, you know, Richard Isaacs crossed his legs casually, like a king sitting upon his throne and examining a peasant who had come to him in supplication. Don't quote Alice in Wonderland to me, she quietly seethed. You're up to something, and I want to know what it is. I have to assume he was about to, because that didn't look like a quote to me. Oh, she was a tempestuous little wench, wasn't she? Now, the, the, the text is taking on a point of view here. Henry Archer didn't deserve her. Hadn't deserved, he reminded himself. Twenty years younger than he was, and manipulative as hell's own vixen. But she'd known how to spend his money, didn't she? But now Henry was gone, and... Anne's... Okay, he, now Henry was gone, comma, and A-N-S, period. She had been left with his considerable fortune, along with his company, and Richard was interested in both. The company and the widow who controlled it, that is. The book's working title title was Naked Ca Naked Came the Bad Fick. Yes, yes, this is perfect. Oh, uh, that I needed just to moisten my throat a bit. Getting a bit dry here. I'm wondering what you'd intend to do with Richard's company. He said. Okay, they must mean Henry's company here because he is Richard. I'm wondering what you intend to do with Richard's company, he said, as the waiter returned with their first part of the meal. Do you intend to keep it, or is it your intent to sell? She waited while their waiter, Frederick, that's nice that she remembered his name, placed her salad in front of her, then saved a generous portion of black pepper and Parmesan cheese, saved instead of shaved, on top of it. She glared at the plate. There's anchovy on this, she huffed. I cannot abide by anchovies. Remove it at once, please, and bring me another. We, oui, madame. Anything to please. The waiter looked annoyed, but he disappeared with the plate and came back a second later with a fresh salad without anchovies. Okay, so Frederick can instantly bring out a fresh salad in the span of a second. So he's like the Flash or something. He just works that fit quickly. Yep. Thank you, Zero. Thank you, Kirby. Ah, oh, very necessary. Uh, satisfied, she speared a crouton with her silver fork and shoved it into her mouth. The waiter smirked with disdain, then carefully placed a bowl of New England clam chowder, all capitalized, in front of Richard. It was hot and fragrant, just the way he liked it. He smiled and nodded. Bon appetit, Frederick said. And they keep changing whether it's Frederick with and without a K. Then he moved away to attend to his other customers. I haven't decided about the company yet, Callie drawled, chewing thoughtfully upon her food. I suppose I could sell it, but she hesitated, daubing at the corners of her eyes with, a, with her napkin. Oh, what would Henry say if I sold the company he struggled so long and hard to build? I imagine he would want you to do what was best for you. Once again, Richard found himself examining her cleavage. So young, so firm, like Florida cantaloupes, ripe for the picking. Ripe for the picking. Although she was young enough to be his own child, he found himself wondering what it must be like to have her in bed, to run his hands through her silky black tresses, to ned and stroke and cajole her breasts into submission, to slip his hands between her thighs and explore the damp, warm secrets within. 
yeah, yeah, that that uh, it's not as it's not as big a run on sentence as we've seen so far, but holy shit. Henry Archer must have done this time and again when they were married, and Henry had only been a few years younger. And now, no, he couldn't. <clears throat> Excuse me. A bit of burp there. Once more, Richard found himself becoming aroused, and he fought to keep his mind on, his, on the more immediate problem at hand. On the immediate problem at hand. You could do this, he said, idly stirring the bowl of chowder. But the company stock, that must be buy the company stock, put on the open market now could fetch a high price, perhaps even ten times as much as it's presently worth on the New York exchange. You could be very rich. I'm already rich, Callie said, but there was a flash of avarice in her dark eyes they rose to meet his. Ten times as much, you say? Surely you jest. I'm not joking. Have you seen today's The Wall Street Journal? The story about Henry's car crash has sent the prices through the ceiling. The Nasdaq itself is running wild. It's the talk of the town. Richard stared back at her. The time to sell is now, Callie, and I'd only be too pleased to help. If only you'd let me. Her breasts heaved against the taut fabric. Of her, okay, that's taut, T-A-U-G-H-T, the past tense of teach, and not T-A-U-T. Right. Her breasts heaved against the taut fabric of her black dress, and again his eyes fell to them. Yes, she would be grateful. And once she'd properly expressed her gratitude, perhaps his friends in the police department would be grateful to him. Henry's tragic car accident had been too convenient, too swift. Callie Archer had more secrets than what she had hidden beneath her Victoria's Secret lingerie. And all he needed to do was get at them, and he would be... Dot, dot, dot. A dark shadow falls across the table, and a new voice interrupted them. Pardon me, but... It... I mean, yeah, they... I... They can be very educational. You can learn a lot from them. Anyway, uh, a dark shadow falls across the table, and a new voice interrupted them. Pardon me, he had said, but is this his seat taken? Richard jerked his head up, peered at the uninvited intruder. Bruce Lucent, the software developer. Young, handsome, well-known around Atlanta for the software he developed. What was he doing here, H-E-A-R? Also, I don't know if I'd call Bruce young. I thought it was established he was 50 earlier on. I couldn't help but overhear, Bruce said, as if an answer to the unasked query. Callie, I'm so sorry to hear about Henry's death. He meant so much to the rest of us. I didn't know you knew him so... I didn't know you knew him well. Richard couldn't help but notice how Callie's eyes roved over him. Bruce was younger even than Callie, yet despite the auto accident he'd suffered, his body was lean and trim, with a youthful verve that Richard could barely remember. Please have a seat. We just ordered. <laughs> yeah, nothing we could repeat. It nothing we could repeat in polite company. Let's put it that way. Uh, why? Thank you. I think I will. Bruce moved to the empty chair at the table, then snapped his fingers for the waiter. Garcon, a menu, please. I mean, it must have been garçon, but there was no accent over. There was no accent in that word, so I'm going to assume he's just Garcon. We oui, at once, Monsieur. And they didn't spell out Monsieur, e Monsieur either. Monsieur. <laughs> Mouth no worky right anymore. And as the waiter hurried away to fetch a board for the unexpected interloper, Re Richard realized that the plot had thickened indeed. Chapter 9. Uh, we'll do one more chapter, then we'll jump to the machine-written chapter. Penelope Urbane let out the clutch as she sped around the curve. She felt a thrill, partly from the roaring engine, from the speed of the car. Parentheses, she was moving fast, too fast, on a suburban street, and she liked the street too much. Close parentheses. Partly, no, mostly. Mostly, it was the thrill of anticipation. She was going to meet Bruce Lucent, and she was eager to see him. She could not have said why she wanted him so badly, but she did. Wanted to see him. That's, that, that was all it was. She was curious, maybe more than curious. Eager, but not too eager. There. That was his home. That was where she was meant to be. She hit the brakes hard, skidded to a stop in front of his home. He was in the doorway, waiting for her. Penny, he said, I've been waiting for you. There was a hint of suggestion in his smile, something that whispered to her dreams. Excuse me. She embraced him 
whispering his name. Bruce, she whispered, and felt the chill of the turgid warmth of his body. He kissed her so lightly. He wanted her. She could feel it in his lips. She wanted him, too, but not so easily. Not here, not now, parentheses. She thrilled at the thro thought. Here, now, no, close parentheses. Dinner, she said. Where will we go? I've got, reser I've got reservations for us at the mall. Le, Le, Moulin de la, Le Moulin de la Galate, Bruce said. <sighs> My tongue is failing me. Penelope Urbane knew the place. It was French, continental, lit by candles, elegant and intimate. She'd gone there she'd gone there once, alone, and eaten Salsies Yeah, Salsies de Frankfurt by a window in the back that looked over the moonlit garden. That'd be nice, she said. I like the way you think, Bruce Lucent. Bruce took a remote control from his pocket, pointed at the garage. An engine roared to life as the door began to shut her open. In a moment, a car emerged, its doors opening gently as a suggestion. Okay, th this dude has a remote control car. Like, he's got... He's got remote start, and he's got... He can drive the car and open the doors. This is Watchdog 2 technology. Watchdogs 2. Uh, I'm just taking drinks to help my throat here. God damn. It's ready when we are, said Bruce. He smiled. I'm always ready, if you are. He was already in on the driver's side. No one had to ask Penelope twice. There are moments when life, like a bad movie, gives us theme music. The good stuff is quiet. Maybe Rachmaninoff played softly in the background. Bach or Beethoven. In the classy films, it's, if it's, in the classy films, it's one of those. Or maybe Mozart. Bruce, Lucent, Bruce Lucent's life wasn't like that. More like, oh, more like popcorn. The electronic pop version. Quick, zippy, headed straight toward a climax. In the end, well, it's a little flat. Too much air, too little substance. It just ain't Beethoven, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, this is the dude... Like, he was in a cast and a wheelchair earlier, and he was still in the cast, and, you know, he had stitches in him, one of which was removed by an erection, and now he's got a remote-controlled car. He's got, he's got like, one of those, like, Tesla self-driving cars. This will end well. Anyway, it just ain't Beethoven, you know what I mean? But it's something, and we can't all be Beethoven. There isn't enough talent in all the world for that. Penelope nestled in the crook of Bruce's arm. It didn't matter to her that the music was popcorn. For her, it was Wagner and the Valkyr It was Wagner and Valkyries all the way. Okay, I, I don't know if this is a rich people thing, but I suspect playing Ride of the Valkyries with your date is going to confuse her. I love your lustrous hair, he whispered. I love red hair, real red. It's so beautiful. Only her hairdresser knew for sure, and it had been years since he'd confided in Penelope. She didn't know what color she'd have without him, and she shuddered at the thought. <laughs> yeah, he was the dude with the dick stitches. This is the same guy. This is turning into Mulholland Drive. You're a sweet man, she said. I love your passion. Bruce grinned. You make me rapturously happy, he said. Penelope Urbane felt a chill that thrilled her. Me too, she said. She raised an eyebrow. I mean, you make me feel so happy too rapturously happy. Yeah, that's the word for it. Rapturous. She could feel his firm, studly body under her left hand. He was smiling at her. He looked hungry. I was in an auto accident once, he said. The doctors told me I'd never walk again. But they were wrong. She smiled, nestling into the crook of his arm. Of course they were, he s she said. How did you recover? I lived my dream, he said. And I didn't let their naysaying dissuade me. She pressed her voluptuous body against him. He was pulling into the restaurant's garage, turning, downshifting, jamming the brake. There they were, parked. The valet came to her door, helped her from her seat. Bruce gave the man his keys and a twenty. The man smiled knowingly. Bruce took her arm and led her to the door, where they waited a long moment for the maitre d. You're in software, she said. Bruce smiled. I'm a software developer, he said. Okay, earlier on, they established that Penelope worked for the company, and she was like arm ca candy that he hired for it, and now she's acting like just his girlfriend that doesn't really know what she know what he does. <laughs> Quite. 
Uh, let's see. You're in software, she said. Bruce smiled. I'm in software developer, he said. Well to do. About 20. I have a studly body, don't you think? <laughs> Okay, I was doing for I was doing good for a while there, but this is getting this is getting back into this is this getting to me again. She looked at him. She looked him up and down. It was indeed the finest body that money could buy. She smiled. If I tell you you have a sexy body, she said, would you hold it against me? Oh God! <laughs> They're doing the line. They did the line. <laughs> that that did the thing. The pickup line. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> he pulled an arm around her, pulled her close. You know I would, he said. Yeah, and she's the one saying it. She's saying the man line. <laughs> Jesus Christ. She purred. I like that, she said. I like Atlanta. It's such a cosmopolitan city. <laughs> Bruce whispered in her ear. It is. Atlanta is a great place for an enthusiastic would-be novelist to write about. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution is a first-rate paper, and CNN is headquartered right here in Atlanta. <laughs> God damn it. Of all things, they're making sexy talk, and now they're talking about the papers and CNN. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, Penelope. Oh, Brad. I'm Bruce. My name is Bruce Beautiful. Oh, Bruce. Dinner was amazing. Brad or Bruce or whatever the stud muffin's name was. <laughs> God, I was doing so good, and it, it's breaking me again. <laughs> okay, Brad or Bruce or whatever the stud muffin's name was ordered the eponymous specialty of the house, the Moulin de la Galat, de la Galat. They call it the food that zings, and it sang for them before it was prepared. They drank before dinner. Bruce ordered, quietly speaking to the waiter, Du Oregon, s'il vous plaît. Double fort. <laughs> Not yet, thankfully, but this is... <sighs> my head hurts, and my, my soul hurts, and I must press on. We're almost there. With dinner, there was a magnum of champagne, and after dinner, there was coffee and brandy. Penelope felt her head swim as she rested it into the crook of Bruce's arm. It was an amazing meal, an experience she would always treasure. She wanted him so bad, and there, in the quiet that was the candlelit restaurant, he touched her. She couldn't resist. He wanted her, and she wanted him too. Oh, God. Right. Chapter 10 takes us back to the Polo Club, and we will jump ahead to Chapter 32, which I believe was the auto-written one. Yes, it appears that it was. Let us see what the machine has in store for us. Chapter 34, thank you. A little hard to remember things now. I am... I'm in a dissociated state of consciousness. Things are, things are weird in my head right now. I, I can feel my brain expanding in directions it was not meant to expand. I have viewed information that the human mind was not, if, d did not evolve to process, and I don't know if I'll ever be the same again. Anyway, once more into the breach we go. Chapter thirty-four of Atlanta Nights. Chapter thirty-four. Bruce walked around anymore. <laughs> Some people might ought to practice. Damn it. <laughs> yes, I see. Some people might ought to her practiced eye at 
<laughs> I am so silky and braid shoulders. At 66, men with <laughs> a few feet away from form their languid gazes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know I was hungry and impelling him lying naked. She slowly made for a man could join you. I know what I ought to take you. Probably should have. He wants it worriedly. <laughs> About think what to wear. <laughs> okay, I need a second here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna breathe. I gotta breathe, I gotta focus, I gotta maintain, I can do this, I can do this, it's just one chapter, I can do this. Then they reached under her time and got out, and did you find my real mother's name, his fancy, rented by a passing delivery truck? Well, Maggie, oh, Andrew, you but I know my leftover cake. Girls are here at one of a pool, and the pool cleaner maneuvering his surprise did that. <laughs> yeah, drinking. Oh. Uh. Girls are here at one of a pool, and the pool cleaner maneuvering his surprise that. He smiled certain her way down cruel and flashed him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Come and get this big afros and indescribable. <laughs> He tender. <laughs> His hands moved surely. Recover for a mess. She'd have noticed if it had so impetuously across the pelting Georgia girl grill. Like, this is some... Like, this is some Colonel Campbell in Big Shell towards the end of the game. I need scissors 61 speech happening here. It's just pure stream of consciousness. I have no idea where we are or what's going on. Isaac's brick red complexions until morning. Maybe some kippers and say to this inspiring exchange. The truth about Margaret, he thought. And, and there he was making any ladies happy until he came away. Down international airports for them. He wasn't the sidewalk behind them. It would do it. Yeah, exactly. Flapjaw, Harikari Rock. <sighs> Margaret studied her sexiest countenance. He was the building opposite highlighted Isaac's thought of. A man expected to him and sent me... <laughs> yeah, he was a web worm in earlier life, exactly. He coughed wetly. It would ruin his body, rinsing twice the usual number of that. Once she got to the goods and his form, and that was rumored to cancel her favorites, as she made his exit, gratified that you must be as if he wants it. It was time to go to the money man. Oh, God, that's a drink. Uh, almost got through it. I can't imagine her voice faded as muddy. Bruce stood by the short hairs. He, he pleased to talk about to such wonderful women's beauty products, like Eaton, that morning, from Margaret's lips he it told. They needed a man who sees us, growled Isaacs. She thought about me, she asked. She hadn't slept well that night, and pulled the floor and then grabbed the report for him. And they told her smiling reflections silently. Plenty of her robes shook left. The avenged age of the wall with delight. She was a rolling boil only in a hint. My mother, my little Maggie. Oh, Andrew, you said. You know, I have to tell that big, by that big old man declared, and this penny was a man to make that phone had gone into the chlorine scented depths. <laughs> <laughs> that man grabbed Callie too. He he had done tricks our ears. Hi, Orange. Welcome to me losing my mind once and for all. Atlanta Nights has broken me. 
Uh, face red hair spread like this. The club staff member polishing glasses. No, Reuben said. If I did, a stick had given Bruce. Adopted! Why couldn't there were and shut, admitting one knew about what had explained? Ya sees in years, but it was. He fitted into a sweat as he held his well-muscled chests. So you're adopted? It's not that silly, Callie slunk. Shake of a look like him. Isaac spoke ever think of fifty-five million, fifty-five million dollars, because they both knew about Penelope. He laughed weakly. His sense of humor welded. Then they reached under her medium short brown hair. Do you know true even better, baby? He knows something. Thought of something. Myself. She put in the sweltering Atlanta heat. Callie interjected. It's hair into a hot tip on the kids? Fine, sir. Going to the geezer who sees us, growled Isaacs. <laughs> She smiled at his side, red lacquered lips, except he had a rolling boil only man whom I love really loved messy. Could it be? Could be anybody, he said, with report with a report from Stick, with Penny for Stick to be married before supper. And Arthur Venice Hey, you haven't heard that name in a while, for the pair of cigarettes and this wet nosed EST would not let me take that for Friday, said elegantly. He paused for good. The rain didn't look like what it was. She was a snow. She was a snowflake scar and those big red handprints on the side. But he kept there. She smiled bewitchingly. At would be upset if he wanted to scream, wanted to talk. Isaac grunted and worry about it. Goose pimples formed, beginning at him. I wish, I wish, I know my foot under with his loving, adoring wife Kelly, twice his age of forty. He knew just to it. Margaret's, you little hot nurse worth her. Don't worry about me, she thought. She put in his pants again, and on her shoulder, the wall. She was a midnight snack to pay to let a horrible noise. Stephen? Weakly came to him, the teenage hacker who'd add anything about it. Who knew? Callie stimulated Gerald erotically. <laughs> <sighs> Callie stimulated Gerald erotically as loud as if a rod, and he owes me tender steak. Perfect. The hotshot developer Bruce stood on her consciousness a little longer. <laughs> Get me Margaret. You surely know to d you surely do know that, Mr. Man said nothing. Then they reached her neck and flipped through the door. She preened. He turned away with me. Quickly! Inside! She really wanted either. She surely loved those hankies. Aren't your parents? Had her face been struggling to be a month that somebody famous? Abraham Lincoln? She went over to Memphis and gave a black and he wouldn't take you away and want to scream want either. She rushed to him and gave him one more thing and gave one more thing. It would not open and shut, admitting one and hunt within. Isaacs couldn't imagine. Her voice behind him and then looked again, typed another letter. Then you can't. Then you can love me off balance into her own incredibly gorgeous copper-haired penny, had it his takeoff checklist, got to the pictures, he had the crude fans, which were the club staff member polishing glasses. Flies like a peach juice decade? Decade? It's important we talk. Isaacs knew what I was on. Oh no, she simpered prettily at him, in a code orange alert. That was it. <laughs> Uh. God, how much more is this chapter? Okay, there's a few more pages. We can do this. Uh, code orange alert. Here we go. That's right. He wasn't worried about what sufficient time to get married. Trembling with sympathy as she stepped forward. Say, I know my little Maggie. Ooh, Andrew, you know somebody at the pictures, he told himself. She leaned in her in case her dreams so badly. Maybe some fresh-squeezed peach packed into the pool. He stood, watered. 
the ladies of the board can get up and down at him. If those spacers aren't your acquaintance, a ma'am, said the pilot, tipping his belt, his fancy, rented by now has come, he said morosely. Can you, but I just thought to keep the two in the gut or maybe banging? <laughs> <sighs> okay, that finished my drink, but I'm going to try to finish this thing anyway. I think this rest of this chapter would just kill me. Uh, or maybe it was that way. She didn't know that. Isaacs took his privates, like this. Penny would be married, and the air heat waves shimmered off by it. She had been fun, but it was that guy's name? She couldn't really be forgiven for ladies, the geezer, who got into Bruce's jacket and took away the door opening behind him. Bubbles responding irritated, responded irritatingly. He'll be married. In a few words, in his pants again and fished out the truth. Bruce waved the other guy. Wasn't going to be glad to rain. <clears throat> to rain thought, as, thought as he was rumored hesitatingly. Callie analyzed. They fooled me. Well, he had his life. The man slipped his takeoff checklist. Got out of them. Weren't even Bruce's hot. And once she cried. You should know somebody at all about getting her mind vomit forth a floor where his cubicle was. On his hip, from a crude photocopy of consequences, she kept there. <laughs> nice! Exactly 666. That's perfect. Thank you for that, Pat. I appreciate that. That was well spent. Still, She had still had heard right. Penny, it's, Penny said he had it come to its tight skirt. Did Callie like a peach juice? It's important. They needed a hot tip and didn't know. You should have figured out like this. Penny's his was gorgeous sunshine on the rail of the clients. She rushed to the bottom. She was a hot tip on the sound changed. And down in his pants again at the Kent's cloth suits. Callie had, an air Callie had inherited a terrorist attack in her office. <laughs> oh. This is this is breaking me. This is it. I'm broken. I'm gone. It's K still says gone bye bye people. It's just I'm on autopilot right now. <laughs> Let's just finish this chapter. Callie had inherited a terrorist attack in her office, I think of that. Once she got to her rear in Crete. But my Blackberry is here. Well the Bennies? Bruce reached into her closet to us vans, the top half of them, would not let him touch of reality. Although her eyes opened, crinkling her short hair trigger. <laughs> Excuse me. What could she, what could be? She purred, and soon they make such a minute observation. Behind him, the club staff crazed. Of course, long space. Who knew? Callie slunk over at a man with sympathy as he held his pants again to avoid saying something white. <laughs> 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 As he held his pants again to avoid saying anything white to speak about the behavior of her tight polka dot dress, the Homeland Security System had pulled him to the side. <laughs> okay, Homeland Security, so that has to be after 2001. So, finally, in the middle of this AI-written chapter, we have some idea of a time and place. Or time, at least. Help, he exclaimed. Let me look bl let me look black with him, especially in the creak of his mind. He had his mind. Let me look black with him. God. Uh, I'd be halfway into another drink by now. He fitted into Bruce's jacket and tie. His hand up hit. He discovered his name was too small for Friday. <laughs> Said it's not open for such a call from a commie round. He told himself. She surely loved those mosquitoes. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, God, I gotta make a pun. <laughs> Oh. Too small for Friday, huh? Uh. She surely loved those huge mosquitoes. Too small for Friday, but not too small for Fly Day. 
Oh, that didn't make any sense at all. She knows some quick revivers at this time. It kept her cool in the guy in the pocket of her fingers across the desert. And then, when is he going to be back? Bruce limped around and looked, saw, pondered, and said who had thought. Believe it, baby, muttered Venice, tossing aside his paper and pushing the cleaners I could. He wasn't worried about Margaret, he said morosely. Can you right there? She gave him. Hey, Babs, Stick pointed out over the Air Force. Especially when Bruce came to a hot tip on the wall. Unlocked one, with Andrew Venice was going to the door, undulating provocatively, as he ran afoul of a man who wasn't all the way down in the seat so badly. Maybe some kippers, and they went to keep a tent around them both. Oh. 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 Afterwards, Andrews, you think we can get up the black who knew? Callie tossed her gunmetal steel gray desk, packing out a letter, looked again, typed another letter. Bruce Lucent knew why, so she thought she'd order something frozen. But nobody does anything white to make herself wake up. What is with this white black stuff all of a sudden? It's like some like 90s stand up comedy. It's like white people from Atlanta are like this, black people from Atlanta are like this. Oh, all things in life and Isaac's brick red complexions until morning. Maybe she'd get married. Trembling with the right mind would go out the door and Isaac hesitated. He wanted to do with Andrew Venice was always important. They fell to have been he who wasn't all. She was hungry and the son of the money man. I just lost a time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just lost the time. I just lost my mind here. <laughs> Why did I do this? Uh, Why did I agree to this? Where did my life go wrong? <laughs> uh, how much more does this AI written chapter go? Okay, the, the, what page and a half. We can do this. We're on the home stretch here. The madness will end. I can go back and let my sanity restore and all's going to be well. Once she got reason to talk with the big toe with him, that was it. Stephen Weakley sounded his reply. I'm fine. Don't worry about what it was. She struggled to read a rolling boil, only faintly flawed by listening. You such a hot little nurse worth her medium short brown hair. <laughs> Do you need to have to be a married, capital T, trembling with the light? She heard the other guy gave massages and off my back. And oh, if she had taken him and planted a sloppy, lipstick-drenched kiss upon his chest, I was back there. She couldn't help him over the edge of the very best of the ladies. He laughed weakly. His Blackberry was a girl to appreciate the usual number of white... <laughs> Carefully capped tea. <laughs> uh, his blackberry was a girl. <laughs> Just remember, I've got to her peerless eyes. No, darling, it stopped very suddenly. What was awake? She does seem to be more sound. Stephen? The rain was coming down at him. I could only break us. I could. He paused for two weeks. How it felt to actually harm the Ceres sometimes had once dated the fridge. He had his relationship simple, discreet, between the day. Well, he was pacing and pacing and driving bubbles looked up. The smile broadened and quite dead hus head husband Henry Archer. Biggest nuisance when you get any clothes on. <laughs> So how about one more? Noted his ears, although he was rumored to watch the pool to get married by Elvis. <laughs> uh, what? What? What the fuck? Uh, Elvis. Venice looking out farther than the end of them <laughs> to be married in case her pretty face toward a tall, swarthy man had made her smile. 
How hard could Morgan have some kippers and grimaced when he discovered much to her across the deeply carpeted floor? Heedless of consequences, she husked voice seductively. Why, yes, Bruce ripped through the frosted glass window of the tangles. <laughs> no doubt about getting her, I couldn't help it. It made for it was, as well put a Desert Eagle 44 Magnum to her eyes, crinkling her ha red hair trigger. <laughs> What were you in your pants that were still pining over and went to the business man? <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. That's it. That's the end of the chapter. That's it. That's it. That's it. It's over. It's over. Thank God. <laughs> Oh, I ran out a while ago. I, I would be well into a fourth drink by now if I went and got another. Holy shit. <laughs> oh my god. I'm done. I'm dead. This is it. Ugh. If I wake up dead in the morning, I want you all to know it was Atlanta Nights that did it. God, it's just it's not even the drinks. Like, I'm still reasonably functional. I'm not actually drunk. I can form sentences and complex thoughts. It's just the sheer insanity of what I'm reading. I know it's an AI. I know it was intentionally written shitty. But the act of saying it aloud just brings it out in a way that otherwise wouldn't. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel like the bot truly captured the essence of this work. Oh my god. Folks, I was not ready for this one. I thought Eye of Argon had braced me sufficiently for this. Travis T, James McDonald, and every other, art, every other writer that was involved in this, you have broken me tonight, and I salute your efforts. I have not laughed hard this hard at anything in my lifetime. I, 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 I am changed. I can feel my brain stretching in ways that I didn't know it could, touching the confines of my skull, and I am struggling to contain it. There is, there is a new evolution of humanity happening right here on the stream, and I don't know where this is going, and I'm vaguely frightened by it. And... Ugh. Yeah, yeah, it's... Here's the thing. I don't really get drunk, per se. I just get... I'm sober, then tipsy, then I just pass out. Like, if I had over, I had drank too much tonight, I would be asleep right now. And, you know, I am gonna crash hard after this. But, holy shit, just... Oh. Even before the AI chapter hit, this thing was just killing my soul, and just reading what a robot could do with his material... Oh. This has been an experience, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to thank you all for joining me on it. I didn't know fully what to expect, but this has somehow exceeded my expectations in every way possible, and in the words of Dr. Breen, some ways that are theoretically impossible that were discovered in this piece of literature. But yes, we will call it there. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I, I need some water or something. I, I need to... I need I, I need to freshen up. Uh, yeah, let us... Let us wrap up for the night. Uh, Hinamori, huh? I don't know if I have followed them. I'll look into that. But yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. This has been an experience. I'm so glad we got to do this together. I'm going to have to find other absolute trash to read on stream, because... Surely there is other stuff out there, and I must find it and experience it for myself. Oh, Mariz is streaming. Excellent. Oh, she's streaming, uh, uh, Phoenix Wright. Awesome. Yeah, that'll work. But yeah, uh, tomorrow night, I've got one more thing for Alpha Protocol I wanted to show off. <laughs> Ideally, it will be me not sucking at the game. I have, a. Uh, a few special things planned. But yeah, next week, we will be starting Hollow Knight. I will be not drunk for that. But, uh, 
I imagine that will not improve my performance so much. I have issues with platformers. We'll see if that holds up. But I am looking forward to it. I, I saw Roku stream that a while back, and it looked it looked really interesting. So I'm looking forward to trying that myself. But yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. Have a good night, and see you next time.